six pack lap of that. And we got the goat Taylor Atwood. Um, my man. We, we were my man, my man. We were just shooting the shit. So this time at Sheffield, so we've in we did commentary together previously, mm-hmm. and you murdered it. And I let you know you murdered it. You you did extremely well. Uh, and, and you seem like a natural in the media capacity and commentary in particular. Um, when me and you went at it, it, it flowed easy. You understood yeah. whole commentary, the duties of the lead, and then we tossed it to you and we bantered, did our damn thing. And it's mm-hmm. that flow is people think they understand, but they don't fully understand. And you can explain to someone and then automatically halfway through, they start trying to lead and it becomes, all right, we don't go back and forth. Mm-hmm. We don't go back and forth in our duties. Otherwise it just ends up like, that's not how it works. And you could do it and tell somebody and then they end up trying to, it, it doesn't whatever about an hour and a half in, mm-hmm. but you understood you know, okay, this is my task. This is my role. This is what I do. And if because of that, once you get someone who does that and knows that, it flows effortless. And it's hard for someone who doesn't know, just listening, like knowing the roles and what goes yeah. into the different roles. Like I've, t- I've, t- I've talked to people and I remember when I was talking to the Sabato boys and Joey on the Sabato boys, uh, the Sabato sessions, I call them the Sabato boys, but you know, the <laughs> British podcast. Yeah. And yep. they were like, you know, we're talking about commentary. And my man, Joey, was like, you know who's my... I was talking about leads and co's and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, you know who my favorite lead is, man? It's probably in the UFC, like, you know, Rogan or DC. And I'm like, yeah, they're not leads, though. Huh? <laughs> uh, the- I remember us <laughs> talking know? about that, yeah. I was like, but those aren't leads, my man. Like, people don't necessarily know who's lead, who's not. Mm-hmm. And it's like, they have different roles and you have to stick to your roles and whatever. Joe Rogan isn't going to go out there and do the play-by-play. He will not even attempt to. If he did, it would be weird. Uh, that's John Anik, who does mm-hmm. the play-by-play. And right. and there's a difference. And you could tell by the tonage, by the way John Anik talks, he's play-by-play. He doesn't mm-hmm. talk like Rogan and DC do, a lot more casually. Right. You hear John, and if you hear John Anik talk in real life on podcasts, he doesn't sound like that normally. He's a normal dude. There's differences that people don't necessarily know. So I'm like, look at don't try to be me and don't try to sound like I'm sounding or whatever. Just do your own thing. It's easier that way. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and you understood straight off the bat. You're like, I got you. This is going to be easier. And it's when people try to do, like, they don't know. They get caught up. I'm like, oh, shit, I think I'm supposed to be doing that. No, you're not. No, no, no. You're getting it mixed up <laughs> or or whatever. I don't know, man. But you, you're leading into it more and more. And I was so happy that you ended up in Sheffield. SPD tipped their hat to you and, and is like, let's bring them in. Let's so first off, how did all that come about? Um, in terms of like obviously, yeah, all, all of the, the background story of you coming on to Sheffield in this role. Yeah. Uh so graciously, Pete, Pete Spence from SBD, for those that don't know, Pete's the US, he's the head guy for the US division of SBD. And he he was the meat director. He is the meat director for Sheffield. So there's a lot of things that go into that, but he, uh, he graciously reached out. I don't know if, if I should say this or not, but I'm going to anyway. Um, so I was the initial uh, uh, reserve for Sheffield and Pete came to me first and said, Hey, look, we're not going to choose you for the wild card. We're not, he didn't tell me who was the wild card, but I, I, I figured it was Gavin. Uh, I immediately text Gavin after because I thought Pete uh, probably called him or something beforehand. And I was like, yo, did you get the did you get the call? And he was like, yeah, I got it. So I it, like and and I knew it. I, I knew it. It was between him and I. So um, after talking with Pete and he told me officially that I wasn't getting the wild card spot, he's like, look, you're the first reserve. And I was like, all right, cool. That's that's fine with me. But that like. Again, I got my, that was back in like right after Worlds. That was in July. And I had gotten my PRP shot in August. And I was like, I was actually feeling pretty good after Worlds. And What's the PRP the, shot just for everyone who might Oh, yeah, know. sorry. Um, so I actually, I have a YouTube video on it. So if you want to go check it out, just YouTube my name, Taylor Atwood. Um, but I did something called platelet-rich plasma, which okay. is they take your blood, they put it in what's called a centrifuge. They spin it around really fast. They separate the good blood from the bad blood, plasma, essentially. And then, so it's this concentration of good blood cells. 
and they inject it into an area that's giving you discomfort. And for me, it was my uh, left quad tendon. And that's, that was what was hindering my, my performance all of 2023, which is why I lost Sheffield. I lost worlds. I just wasn't a hundred percent. So I did that procedure at the end of August last year, 2023. But unfortunately it takes, and fortunate, it takes about they say anywhere from two to 12 weeks to fully form new biology within that tendon once you're done with mm. it. So I got the first shot at the end of August, beginning of September, and I did a three round shot. And my last shot was on September 11th, which was right before my birthday. That's why I remember it so vividly. Also, it hurts like a bitch. <laughs> um, but <laughs> if, if you're interested in, in checking out that procedure, if you have any injuries, like a, a tendonitis or tendinosis, whatever it may be. Um, that's certainly something you can check out and it's all WADA approved. Um, so I, I lift in the IPF, of course, and we have to make sure I'm in that registered testing pool, the RTP. I get randomly drug tested, blood tested. So I have to ensure that every procedure and treatment that I do fits under that guideline. So the PRP shot actually did, does and did. So I, I did that and unfortunately it just took literally like 12 12 weeks to really form a new knee essentially and i just wasn't back to 100 percent. so i hit up pete probably towards the end of december right before uh or right after christmas right before the new year and was like hey look i was really hoping that i'd be further along in my rehab process and i wasn't and i want to forego my my reserve spot and give it up to someone else. And Shell was it actually just came off his European performance of hit, excuse me, of hitting 800. And I, I knew, I knew they were going to invite him. And I was hoping that they would have because he deserved it. And for me, I just would have been not limping onto the platform, but I like, personally, I thought I was well above 800 in my total. But I thought that Tim, and we can get into the Sheffield performances as well, but I thought Tim and Cali were coming in like they were talking a good game. And just based on what Cali's performance, like over the last, like leading into Worlds from, I think it was Europeans into Worlds, he, he had put on like a ridiculous amount on his total. So I'm like, man, it's not impossible for him to potentially be over that 800 threshold so Maybe what tim, i did tim had a huge deadlift going tim, into it as that's well. right that's in a squat so mm -hmm. i was like look i'm not i'm not gonna put myself in that predicament again where i'm not 100 percent. where i know i know without a shadow of a doubt i can beat these guys and i, I it, it was it was selfish on my part but also like i i just didn't want another worlds or sheffield happening so i forewent my opportunity and pete graciously once i told him that he's like look i would love we want to throw something else in there with interviews we want to interview people after the uh, interview the lifters after they're done and, I, and he's like would you want to do that with amelia potter and i was like hell yeah <laughs> so <laughs> that's like i i still wanted to be a part of of sheffield um and, and great it, it graciously sbd and, and pete signed off on it and uh that's how it, that's how it came about but he he was in um, Austin, Texas, when I, my first debut on on the media with you, uh, we commentated the 83s, and uh, I think it was the 93s as well. Um, so yeah, it, it, he he liked what he heard there. Um, everyone kind of said, "Yeah, he's he's a shoe in." So that's that's how it came about. But I I I loved I loved commentating with you at. Uh, PA Dude, was, as soon as we were done, I looked over at Pete and I was like, You know, he did good, huh? Like, you know, <laughs> he did good, didn't he? Like, I already knew you, you can tell when somebody's they're taking the role well and they and they they're, they're killing it. And you're like, Oh, shit, we're you could tell when there's a chemistry going as well. You're yeah, like, oh, we got it. You can feel it. And you're like, Okay, we're on point right now, we're vibing off of each other. We're you know, and um, so it worked well. And I was like, This won't be the last, this won't be the end. And you, and you get I mean, no bigger than Sheffield in terms of uh, obviously Pete was confident in you to to give you the Sheffield role. A couple things there. It's pretty cool that well, a um, you said like 
I selfishly pulled out, but I would say that was pretty unselfish of you. A lot of people, because of Sheffield and event, they wouldn't, they would just, they would just show up regardless. And I'm not saying I would be above that myself. <laughs> if I'm like, man, I don't know how many opportunities I'm going to have. I'm going to take it. But for yeah. you to say, let me back out. Let me, let me give people enough time December. So whoever might come in would have December, January, February. Like that's a decent prep. And it's also, so that was biggie, I, I think, and unselfish, I would say, for not only yourself in a possible reserve, but also for SBD to be like, look at, you guys probably want someone as close to 100% also, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you guys probably would like that as well. But also, I thought it was cool as shit that the way it worked out, and we, I think we all were thinking it'd be Shell after Europe. It'd be Shell after him putting up 800. And him, him coming on the podcast and Asking for it, asking like if you don't have the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Yeah, close mouth don't get fed. You use whatever cliche you want, but it's true. Mm -hmm. And openly, openly, people will tell you sponsors, whatever, bark, make noise, make people, make the community want it as well. Shell came on the podcast at the Euros and was like, "I want that spot. I want that reserve spot. I feel like I earned it. If I don't get a wild card, like give it to me." And and everyone knew the battle of the 74s was super popular at worlds like that the mm -hmm. highlight videos for that session was very high very entertaining and shell would be in there so if not you um it makes sense and he's 800 and also the lineage and we could talk about this as well the lineage and linkage to you and your era you know you two being the ogs from that era and your your careers being linked like that it was such a almost poetic movie like if you're taking out atwood but you put in shell oh shit it's like yeah. okay like that was kind of cool too it was kind of cool too so the whole thing i love and uh, and so tell me about that tell me about when you found out it was him for sure you were saying you thought it might be were you hoping it would be him and when you found out it was was it kind of like you know how did you feel about all that as well well i, I wish i would so again i was feeling good uh coming into december like i was like all right if i really get called in from the bullpen uh and, and shit delaney was close i heard his podcast and i he's close to me as well but he was close to pulling out mm. so like i knew that there was a shot and i was i, I was close to him here in, in new york so <laughs> i was telling jason like yo i i really think that delaney is highly considering pulling out like we need to be ready so we started ramping it up a little bit, but uh, the knee just wasn't great. It wasn't there yet. So, and that was leading into December. So we were like, all right, we got to figure this out before the year end, because we, if, if we have to pull out, we got to give someone else a shot that at least they have like maybe a six week prep. Um, so it, it just made sense that like, okay, Europeans was what November, I think it was, either late November or December. It's always around there, but around yeah. there. So we were like, well, it makes sense. So Shell coming off his 800 kg total, I was I was actually happy that he he finally hit that that mark because um, if anyone were to break it, I'm happy it was him. Because again, it goes back. I like, it's only right in 2019, I set the world record at 790 and a half. And then he comes back in 2023 and, and breaks that record. So I, I was happy, man, honestly, like as crazy as that may sound, uh, we were rivals back in 2017, like, and we'll talk about rivals as well. Cause I'm not doing nationals and we can talk about, uh, mm -hmm. talk about that, but uh, PA Nats, but yeah, like I, I was happy when, when I heard that it was going to be show because one, he already set the world record a little higher, so the 74s had a little more room and, and yeah. had to do a little bit more work. <laughs> uh, so it wasn't going to be this easy total to break. Um, and look, I, like him and I have history. He beat me once. I came back, beat him, beat him. So we're tied right now. Um, and yeah, I, I just... I'm happy for him because he, I know he was battling with injuries 
He has a kid just like I do. We're almost pretty much the same age. And for him to come back, like we've, you've talked about it. I've, I've heard you like, he is an inspiration to me now. And I, we're, we're on the same path and he's yeah. he, he, like, we're, we're in the same era. Um, so seeing him still in the mix at his age, at our age, we're still relevant. Like, I'm really curious how, like, what is the average age of a power lifter current? What would you have well, if you had to guess? In the open. It'd have to be in the open because obviously we have masters right, on screen right, at all. But, course, um, yeah, in open. That is interesting. It, it's, well, here, here's, there'll be at the average age of a power lifter in the open. And then there'll be the average age of a power lifter in the open at the world championships. I think it'll be a little better because it'll right. cut off local meets who are doing it hobbyists. Uh, yeah. But if you make it the worlds and you're going to pay to travel or whatever, you you've beaten everyone else in your nation, et cetera. So I'd be interested. That's a good question. I'd be interested in that. And I'm sure there's some powerlifting nerds who could find that. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually curious if so, if, uh, if anyone knows, let me know, uh, DM me or DM Ryan, whatever, but like I'm 35, bro. <laughs> Shell's 35 and it's we're going crazy. up against we're going up against kids that are like 24, 25. Like their literal day job is to eat, sleep, breathe, powerlifting. Mm. Agatha, for example, that's, that's like her first full-time job. I was talking to her after Sheffield and uh, like, I was like, what do you do for a day job? She's like, powerlift. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, what do you do have anything? Like, do you coach or powerlift? I was like, Oh shit. Okay. Uh, so in, she trained six, like six, seven days a week. I'm like, fuck. If I had that luxury, bro, holy shit! What? What? She did. She she did six SPD days a week. <laughs> That's right. To get up to 585. Now she's changing it a little, but to get to 585 so quickly at 20 years old, we're like, how? She goes, I did six SPD days a week. Absolutely insane at 20 years old. Like that is yeah. that is wild. Um, the and I, I want to talk about Sheffield because like the women, they blew my mind. Um, and I'm gonna be real, the the men's side, no disrespect. This is all, but you got to call a spade a spade. Like they underperformed in my in my opinion. Delaney, I think was like maybe the the outlier there, and Gustav, and Gustav but, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, but everyone else, man, like I was expecting big things the amount of talk that everyone had um so it, it yeah it was it was tough but to back to the original question of, of shell yeah i was I, i'm happy that he got the reserve i'm happy that they gave him the call and i'm happy that he got to experience that because um i know austin's coming in this year and he's almost a shoe in to win worlds so i don't know if shell will get that opportunity again to to be at sheffield at least 2025 um maybe who knows but yeah like i was just happy that he got to experience that and he was doing the v they had him in the vip they i love had that him. yeah like it was cool it was it was awesome i I'm, gave him props yeah for sure for sure uh and they, they SPD, did the same man. for you too which which like spd is classy the way to do it where like you have been a loyal spd flag waiver for a long time you are definitely the 74 kilo goat. If you want to talk about pound for pound goat at the very least, they have to say you're the 74 kilo goat and you were the pound for pound King during your era. It gets weird saying goat all time pound for pound. Cause there's different eras, whatever. Yeah. But at least in your era, you had every single formula tested and tested and untested world record in the world title and best lifter at world. So you had like, it was everything you could have. Mm -hmm. So that should be that you had an error if everyone, so for SBD to be like, bring them in, bring them in, fly them in, put them up um, to have you on the broadcast visible, your face visible on it as well. Um, not just your voice or whatever people recognize there's Taylor Atwood and you're interviewing people. And then in the meet and greet, a hundred percent throw you in there. People are going to see the go and be like, let me talk to him. Let me freaking Taylor's here. Let's, Let's let's talk to this guy. Let's take pics, whatever. I love that they gave you that. And Shell as well. And uh and Mark Mark Jenner from uh Norway, Brink, the two Norwegians, yeah. 
bring him in and freaking let him, you know, use him as much as you can. And right. I loved seeing him at the banquet, you and him at the banquet together. <laughs> and I remember I posted that picture like, what year is it? What yeah. year is this? And yeah. it's so crazy, like, how time passes in, yeah, from previously, like, way back in the day, we were on the podcast, and you guys were, like, calling each other out. And it was, like, soft call-outs, especially back then. Or at the time, it was like, oh, my God. But if you listen to the podcast, they were pretty soft no, was, yeah. call-outs. They, <laughs> but for then, for 2017-18, it was like, holy shit. You know, like, you know, it was wow. Like, for somebody to be like, yeah, you won Worlds, but I wasn't there when you came back and won 2018. Then we hyped 2019. But um, now, you guys are in your mid-30s, fathers, jobs, coming back from injuries. And, like, you guys have been there. So, when you look across the room and see each other, any other athlete in that room who knows how you feel is him. Because he thought he was done. He thought he was done. He talked about it. He's like, Ryan, I... He was in tears someday, some days getting out of bed. He was as finished as finished gets. And he's like, I thought I'd never be back. And for him to come back, you know, it's, it is ironically it becomes like, yeah, the guy who was my rival now is the the closest tie to what I, what I feel, what I'm going through everything. Like we know, because we've been through that And a lot of these young guys and girls who aren't there yet, they will at some point, you will yeah. at some point. It, it, Father Time is undefeated. So come talk to me when it happens. But I love that you guys got each other and you met up at the banquet, exchanged some stories, catched up, pleasantries. I was going to take a picture of you guys like boxers and, uh, <laughs> staring each other down. Both of you guys like, nah, you're going to do that. It was 2018. We ain't doing that yeah, now. We're not nah. like that. And I was like, oh, shit, I kind of <laughs> like that. I was like, oh, you, got, you guys were like, you know, I don't know. I liked it. Time changes some things. But um, yeah, I'm interested in seeing what he does. Hopefully... At Worlds, Austin's coming in like a bull, but if he can get super high total, who knows? To your point, you don't know if he's going to make it to Sheffield in the future. You don't know who, what battles will be closer and more interesting for wildcard action. Maybe he could get close enough to Austin that it is. Um, but he had that. He had he was there, and he mm-hmm. was honored. He wasn't yeah. just in the crowd. He he had a poster up, and he was at the banquet, and people knew like that's that's a world champion, world record holder. That's that's a man right there. That's that's a legend right there. And he got given that. That's the means something there. It means no, something for SBD. One hundred percent, man. And that's that's SBD though. Like the way that Ben runs the company is, it's just professional from top down, literally to the people that are making the products, like. We got to go as athletes when you go into uh, Sheffield and you get to go to the SPD headquarters to shoot content or do whatever it was, you get to meet everyone that's that's literally from the people that are cooking within SPD headquarters to the people filming and making content to the designers to the stitchers, um, literally down to the people boxing everything. Um, they also, I don't know if this was announced, but they're making belts in-house now and you get to Mm. meet the people doing that and working the machines and when they did the belt campaign for the 10 millimeter i got to meet everyone and they're all every single one of them and this is another crazy part so as people don't know this like the people that work for sbd they don't know much about powerlifting as crazy as as crazy as that may sound so because it's a factory in the it's that's like, right you know you work for a factory that's right and you you you're not necessarily super into the factory like you're just it's a job for you that's right and i remember the first sheffield i was walking around with this sbd t-shirt and some lady in her car yelled at me and honked like hey i work there <laughs> and i'm like uh she like clearly was not into powerlifting or nothing because i think i was with like like we were with a gang of powerlifters that's all you had right. there and she and i was like yeah, no shit. Like, do you, we're literally to my right and left is God knows whatever world champions I'm with. But all she saw was an SBD t shirt. Like, that's what you got to say. You obviously <laughs> don't follow power up the years. Like, hey, that's pretty cool. I work there. Why do you have that shirt on? What do you mean, why do I have this shirt on? Do you see what I'm with? Do you know who we're here for? It was hilarious. Yeah. But yeah, it's a job to them. It's a job. That's it. So, so to, to be able to see that, that level that SBD is at, um, the level of professionalism, even at the the very base of the company, uh, is is phenomenal, and that's how they conduct their business in every aspect that they do. And Sheffield, clearly, you can see the level of professionalism being brought into the powerlifting realm there. 
So for, for them to, to be able to do that with the reserves, it's not even like we, for me, I didn't even know I had, I was going to be a part of the VIP experience. I, I, I didn't know until the day of I was walking in and they were setting up the VIP lounge and they were putting up all the displays of all the athletes. And someone went over and was like, Hey Taylor, I got a surprise for you. I forget who it was, but they opened it up and it was, it was my banner. And I was like, what? Like, what, what is this? Uh, and they're like, oh, you're a part of the VIP. And, and they put it up, put me over by a table, Michelle, and I forget the other Norwegian. Um, Martin Jenner. Martin Jenner, yeah. So we were all lined up and I was like, I'm going to be a part of, of the VIP. Like, okay, let's do this. And little did I know I'd have one of the biggest cues uh, there without even competing. So the level of support that I have team Atwood is, is strong, man. Um, and, and SBD recognizes that. And yeah, I've, I've been loyal to SBD cause they've been loyal to me. So I like, the, you know, it's crazy. Kim Walford was the first one that, that reached out to me in 2016 before, before Colleen, Texas, uh, and was like, Hey, SBD wants to sponsor you for this meet. And, and I was just like, well, what does the sponsorship entail? She's like, oh, you get a free, uh, you get a free kit. And I was like, what is it? What does that mean? She's like, oh, you get knee sleeves, wrist straps and a singlet and a shirt. I was like, fuck yeah. <laughs> like I, I got to pay my way out here. Like I, I'm getting free equipment. Like, hell yeah, let's do this. Um, so it's, it, I've, I've been with them since 2016. And they, even when I lost worlds in 2016 and 2017, they still wanted me to be a part of the the SPD team, so I'm forever loyal to them um, because they they've just treated me like like royalty essentially since I well, started. I mean, it well first like them having you at the meet and greet, it's kind of like having like a Hall of Fame type of as Sheffield moves on. I would love if we're at Sheffield ten for them to bring back famous either champions of Sheffield, but also famous world champions, famous whatever for the meet and greet. I think that'd be fantastic. Just to have, as Sheffield gets bigger and the venue itself gets bigger and by year 10, let's say we're at 10,000 people, which isn't no stretch because they're they're all, they're going to sell out before Worlds even happens and we even know the roster. And that's like 2,300 people sold out when you don't even know who's going to be there yeah. at all. So Four, and that's year three. So for sure by year 10, if there are like 10,000 people, I would love if they start having the meet and greet is the current as well as it just expands because there's more and more people will get way too congested with just those lifters. So you actually have also another wing of like Hall of Fame, world champions. You fly them out specifically for a meet and greet, specifically for different roles, whatever. Like mm -hmm. me and you, like I think that's fantastic. And them doing it year two already with you and Shell and Mart already bringing you guys out um, I think it was a very good idea. I mean, let's, if Taylor's out here doing interviews and working media, we'll get into the other presentation we did together as well. But yeah, if Taylor's out here working with us for that, um, let's throw him in there for sure as because he's he's Hall of Fame worthy. And I would love if they started doing, leaning more and more on that as the years go and looking at opportunities like that. Because because can you imagine having in 10 years time, having like uh, guys who, who ought to have been that, at the original Sheffield, like if Brett Gibbs had a booth. How mm -hmm. much would people love to meet Brett again after all these years and be like, dude, how you been? It'd be, people would go crazy. It would actually be part of the show and be wa the wildest. Or long after, like guys like Russ are done in 10 years time when he's bring him back, bring bring people back and have people be like, wow, this is a, like, it's a meet and greet, but also of the current, but also a meet and greet of these legends. They're like, I got to see this guy. You know, I got to see like, you know, I got to meet this person, ask questions. People will geek out about it. So I think, them doing it first with you was awesome. And I would, I would love to, if they, if they keep leaning into that um, yeah. and, and start thinking in that direction. And as time goes, you know, it becomes more and more prominent. Um, and then also me and you, my man, you stepping up quick, like a G <laughs> they were like, listen, we, we want <laughs> you guys to give a presentation. Yeah. And it was relatively <laughs> quick turnaround. I remember Pete asking me, he's like, look at, you don't got a lot of time prep. It was like a couple days before we we were to fly out that week of, and I wasn't entirely sure what the what the presentation would be. It was to all of their 
vendors like SPD France, SPD Thailand, SPD, yeah. et cetera, in certain nation. And there's a room full of people, but it was a, I didn't even know what the venue would be or whatever, but it was a lot of, a lot of people. It looked super nice. People were dressed up, food yeah. out. And, and the whole nine of me and you walked in and we were, and I, I was like, is Taylor going to be with me? Cause if I have <laughs> someone to play off with, it's even easier. Yeah. And Pete's like, yeah. So then the day of, they're like, just hit a couple points, this, that, and the other, and then end off with showing the trophy. And I was like, mm -hmm. all right. Mm -hmm. And me and you hopped in there. I remember them handing me a mic. I'm like, oh, brother. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> yeah, we ain't going to need it. Don't worry about that. Not for this intimate of gathering. Um, and me and you, and we had chairs. I'm like, I don't need a chair neither. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm energy, Doug. So, um, and sometimes what, what I find is, because I've done public speaking before, and um, if I have a mic, because it's projected, if it's a tight, intimate, get intimate enough, tight enough that I don't need a mic, but they give me one, I actually won't talk as loud and energetic because my voice is, it'll be too much because yeah. it's out of speakers. But I want to, I want you to feel I'm getting excited. So I put away the mic and let me just talk like this. And it makes me, then I can raise my voice and be whatever. Mm -hmm. um, not that I'm like shouting at them, but me and you, dog. Again, just like in the commentary, when me and you stepped in, if I, I'll set it up, and if I throw it to you, you, you just pick, up, you just grab that ball and run, and it was seamless. And I was like, oh, my man has got me. You never know what you got. You never know if the person to your side is going to start freezing up a little, get a, and I'm cool with it. I'll do whatever. But you never know what they're going to do. And me and you went back and forth. Or yeah. like 20, we went right to the time limit. We had 20 minutes. We went like a, like a stitch over and then, um, and then presented the trophy and everything. And it was, mm -hmm. and then afterwards, uh, Will with SPD was like, damn, you guys, that was, <laughs> that was, I didn't know you'd be able to do that straight up. I gave you your notes before, like right before. And I'm like, we're good, man. Yeah. The confidence I got when me and you walk in there, it means a lot. It's good, man. And, For and sure. you stepped up. Well, I think. Well, you have a phenomenal way of taking the lead for sure. And your knowledge of the event itself, given that you were the lead at, on live stream, you had a plethora of knowledge of all of the lifters. So setting the stage, I think, just came naturally for you. And then for me, it was it was just when you kicked it over, uh, you talked a little bit about um, just the event key matchups to look for and then i kind of just played off of well if you it, since that's your realm uh i know a little bit about that but i'm not going to put all my all my eggs in that basket i i'm going to talk about my story because that's what everyone kind of i think what i can offer in terms of value to these people and what they want to hear they want to hear the experience from an athlete that has been there already and when Will asked us to just give our, like, give a quick introduction of what was happening, I was like, all right, I'm going to lean into the fact that I got to be here last year and kind of the journey of getting to where we're at in powerlifting today with Sheffield, I think, being the pinnacle and being able to just give my experience just makes it that much easier, right? Like when you get to talk about yourself, that's, it's, it, it's natural. So but I think us, we're a dynamic duo, man. Like we're able to feed off of each other. Uh, I mean, shit, we can we can sit here probably for three, four, five hours if we really wanted to and just shoot the shit. So it's very easy when you have someone to talk to and just kind of feed off of ideas. Um, but I just love conversation, one. And when it's a sport that I absolutely love, it's e it even makes it that, that much easier too. So uh and when I get to bring my experience into, because I think that's where like Cormier and and Rogan kind of come into play. Like they have done, they do it. They they mm -hmm. they are a part of that MMA. They they train jujitsu, whatever it may be. Um, so when you're able to bring the audience listening into that realm and give it from a player's perspective, it just makes it that much more immersive of an experience. So that's what I try to give to the audience themselves. And that's what I think made our commentation at PA Nats uh, so good was because I was able to kind of 
play off of, hey, well, this lifter does this ritual and this is this may be why I don't like it's just speculation, but at least coming from like me knowing that I have rituals and there's certain things that I do on game day that I don't do in my everyday life and so on and so forth. I'm able to give some some background into uh, the lifter's mindset instead of you just watching a, a, a guy or woman lift. It's no, I want to tell you about they had to train. They had to fly. They have to do a water cut. They have to uh, warm up. How did their warm ups go? How are they feeling? You can see when, like, if they're coming out, are they confident? How do they look? How did that bar come when they're stepping back for their squat? Does it look the same every time? And there's just mm. little things that you're able to pick up where you can talk to the audience and say, "Oh, he, he or she missed this, and they didn't. It didn't look the same as the second, and that may be it." Blah blah blah. So you're kind of just playing off of that. Uh, but there's there's an eye for certain things and you have it and I'm able to kind of give that that uh, I guess player experience as well so we work well together for sure 100 like you're um, in the Sheffield presentation to the vendors nobody is like every some people have experiences but you're you know what your unique experience is you mm -hmm. know like you've won multiple world titles you've competed at sheffield coming into this very few people are have that experience even the people who are lifting at that event in number two a lot of them didn't have that so you could bring that and right. say like i i remember getting the if i remember it was nothing like before I, you could talk speak to that and that's, that's something right. that you bring and you know you bring that a handful of people in the world have so that is something big and um, and I'll tell you one thing, when it comes to commentating, here's another pet peeve of mine. If I'm trying to build something, like I'm, oh, I, I try to build storylines for people to give a shit about when they're watching, okay? Right. So if someone misses a lift or something like that, like misses lift number two or whatever, and I'm trying to build some suspense and be like, what does that mean? I mean, they are backed into a corner now. Now, here's what's going to happen. And I'm trying to build possible storylines. And, oh, let's see what happens if their competitor hits. They hit. Now, here's what. And sometimes the co just wants to be a good guy, good girl. So he's like, yeah, they miss, but I'm sure they'll come back and hit. They'll come back, yeah. But I'm sure they're going to get it on the third. And it's just something you say to be nice. Like, yes, they did, but I'm sure. And they try to fluff it off real, real quick, real quick. Not trying to go down that rabbit hole discussion. It's like, my friend, but that's not what we're trying to do, huh? Like, we're trying to talk about storylines. What does it actually mean? Whatever. We're not trying to, we're not being their mental coach, reassuring them. They're not even listening to this. And we, our role isn't also, if they come back and listen to it afterwards, they're like, well, you guys doubted me. I don't care about the one lifter. I care about the 250,000 people watching Sheffield. Mm -hmm. at home i care about Which the quarter is, million wild. i that's care wild. about the quarter million more than the one or, or like the world's got four hundred thousand on yeah. the olympic youtube like i care about the half a million watching that not the one lifter's feelings you know when i reword that you doubted me <laughs> yeah yeah that's my job right you know what i'm saying like i your feelings aren't as good as i'm here for the viewing experience so i'm gonna say all the scenarios. And if you back yourself in the corner, I'm going to say you've backed yourself into a corner. Or if yeah. you made a technical mistake, it's like, oof, they, they got to tighten that up and they have one more attempt. And I'm laying it on thick so that if you do it, you're a hero. If you don't, oh my God, the door just swung open and now the opposition has the ball and you, 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 you set the table. It's our job. And some people get it and other people want to mitigate and be like, no, no, but Ryan, I'm sure he's, she's going to come back and get it. <laughs> it's like, well, thank you for just killing that story. <laughs> right off. Thank you for pruning that right off the tree and right before it gets ripe. Thank yeah. you. Uh, let's just let let's just have nothing to talk about for, right. for bench or whatever. <laughs> if it's bench, give me something. I'm working here. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you get it. Like, there's like, anyways. Um, no, and I, you I, can do it. For, Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, like, from, you could say it also from an athlete point of view where, where you could say, like, look, and I've, I've been here mm -hmm. and I've, I've tasted both, you know, and you could, you could say certain things like, like it come, it, it'll hit a little different when you say it as well. It gives it a credibility that people can't push back on to be like, yeah, no, that was a pivotal miss. 
and that it's going to be very difficult to come back from. They're going to make, well, Atwood saying, you know, like it's, it's, it gives it a little something, something where you're like, yes, they can come back, but there's, this is pressure cooker. I've been, you've been in showdowns. You've been behind the eight ball. You've been winning, going into deads. You've been losing, going into deads. There's different feelings for both and not it, like you've all the different scenarios All right, all the different scenarios. And you, you could speak to it with a different credibility and authority. Um, so to your point, that's what you could bring to the table for it. And I do like that. Not only, but even then, sometimes I get people who have that, but they don't know about commentating and building storylines and do, understand what I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. And they will dance to the beat. Like my man, I'm trying to lay something down here. Work with me. <laughs> <laughs> Work with me. No, uh, it's, it's definitely one of those things. It's, you have a tough job because you, you're my boy and like, we have a good relationship, but you also have to play that devil's advocate on the other side of commentation, which is calling a spade a spade and then making a scenario a scenario because that is it. But if if you're just going to sit back there and try to be the good guy all of the time, it doesn't give good context because um, I, I, to your point, someone can back themselves into a corner like, oh, he, just, he or she just jumped. 15 kilos on their second attempt they've never done that they've only jumped seven and a half before they're kind of just going out on a limb i don't know if they're going to be able to get this we'll see yeah and yeah. we're not doubting you it's just this is what the data has shown us and what you've done previously and what you're doing now and the 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 viewer may not have that context so you it's as the, good. It makes it oh, right. Fuck. What does right. the viewer now leans like? Oh shit! They haven't done right. this. Oh, right. Why are they doing it now? Right. And I'm setting you up to be a hero. Throw egg in my face. I take it too. I understand my role. I have to have egg in my face sometimes. Good. Yes. I I will set you up like holy fuck. What is Taylor doing? This is desperate. And right. this reeks yeah. of desperation. Yeah. Oh my god. Taylor has gone into. And then if you nail it, it becomes. You oh. throw your hands up and smile, and it's like, oh, he's done it. You know, the, the risk is paid off. I would back in it. Like, it's, it's, uh, but we have to. We have to. You, yeah. People, uh, most people get it. They'll allow us as commentators to do our role and make it exciting. But there's the odd person who will replay it back and be like, yo, you doubted me, man. You, you know, or whatever. There's, there's, so that's an interesting point, too, because I think that I would rather personally, this is just, me taylor atwood as a person i would rather you talk shit to my face and tell me how i'm doing or performing or whatever it may be talk shit to my face than someone talking shit behind my back and me not knowing and then us thinking that we're cordial that is the like that's a number one pet peeve of mine well a very high pet peeve of mine well, in this case that's a different story. we're not talking about talking shit though no in this I, case, I mean yeah. like it, it's more that's just the point i i not talking shit. It's just like calling a spade a spade. That's all. That's all it is. Uh, like I'd rather you be vocal about it than not be vocal about it, and then vocal behind the scenes. Because for me, I feel I am still cordial because I. For me, it's a job. As a you're gonna find out. It's weird because now you're doing media, and mm -hmm. um, you're gonna start being in that end of things. And it'll be like, oh shit! It'll feel different. It'll feel weird. <laughs> you do an analysis, like in Sheffield, you did the analysis before that it started. Um, yeah. you're doing interviews, and and I mean, you've done commentary, so you're gonna start feeling what I mean. But for me, so people would be like, oh man, I thought Six liked me or whatever. No, I do. Are you kidding me? It's freaking like they're like dog, oh, like or like, you know what I mean? Where it's n absolutely nothing personal. You were just doing an analysis job, just like you did an analysis job for Sheffield. But there yeah. will be some, um, it'll be interesting for you. When the shoe is on the other foot, the more <laughs> and more you do these gigs, it'll be like, yeah, it'll be interesting. You'll you'll feel it here and there. Um, yeah, and, and I started, so I know some UFC fighters, they're more and more becoming commentary for the UFC. And all, some of them have podcasts like Michael Bisping, DC, yeah. et cetera. And it became norm, if you're doing a podcast, let your co-hosts make the picks. But if you're working the event, don't do the picks because it started running into conflicts where it's like you picked against me and in your commentary, you're trying to prove yourself right. So even if I win, it feels weird or what. So I stopped. If I'm working an event, I stopped doing picks for that event. Some people are like, no, nah, we want to hear your picks. 
like people who listen to podcasts, like, no, give your picks. But then I'm like, I think we're getting big enough. I, I'm just following suit of a bigger sport that is already, we did Sheffield. It's professional. And it looks like a UFC one night event type deal. Like, like a UFC feels like that. So the, once we started feeling in that motion of professional money, one night event, blah, 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 I started following suit of the UFC. So if it's euros and I'm not commentating euros, I'll get my picks and I don't feel mm -hmm. no ways about it. I'm not working at the event, but if I'm working an event, I kind of sort of am. I don't want people to come at me or, or the IPF or Sheffield or SBD. Sorry. It's weird. I'm, we're all yeah. negotiating and work moving in our directions, but we, people have to allow us to do commentary without being like, look at, if you say anything negative, have you are, have you thought of this yourself? If you're like, fuck, man, people are gonna start thinking of me differently. No, I didn't even think about this. <laughs> I I I haven't. No, I have not thought about that. But I have been thinking more about how I uh, say th certain things and how I react. Um, because I I I do I did a ton of retrospectives in 2023, right before Sheffield. And that was, it was, it was somewhat marketing, but I also just believe wholeheartedly in myself, because if you don't believe in yourself, then I don't think that not, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't get him to drink. So if you don't have that wholehearted belief that you're going to go into any competition and, and win, um, you've already lost in my opinion. So <laughs> I think that I could have handled myself a lot better in certain scenarios you got some great uh sound bites from me <laughs> but <laughs> uh, god bless hey god bless me <laughs> i ain't mad at that at all but uh i i've learned the hard way now that i have to truly be careful about what i say how i say it because anything that i say is going to get taken literally or figuratively and get taken out of context regardless of how I say it and why I say it, whatever it is. Right. So I did, but I didn't think about it from a commentation standpoint where, uh, picking someone, you can already have a bias in your commentation. Um, yeah, I, I didn't even think about that because I, I see it now. It makes, it's logical. It makes sense now, but I was more or less when I was going into it, there were certain things where training again, coming from the, the lifter side, right? I don't give a shit what you do in training. Your training can look absolutely phenomenal. There's some people that don't do SBDs on, on one day, they hit their, their top sets on different days and that's their total. That's how they count their total. For me, I'm very specific. I hit my SBD day, and I, if I'm prepping or something, I'm hitting singles as, on squat bench and deadlift. So, like, my fatigue is there. So, if something's moving at tremendous speeds <laughs> towards the back end of my, my training, that's where my confidence comes from. But, I like, again, it still doesn't translate on the day sometimes. So regardless of what you do in training, I am just the wholehearted advocate of, I just want to see you show up on meet day and, and how you perform. So when I was doing my analysis prior to Sheffield, uh, I, I was looking at every single athlete on the roster. And Sunita, for example, when she hit 300 <laughs> in the gym, and I was, a, I was a little doubtful. I was like, look, you have a different, you have a different environment. This is your first time going to be on this huge, massive stage where you have thousands of people screaming at you. Um, it's a different environment, whether good or bad. Some people revel in that, i.e. Mr. Burn Your Ships himself, Gavin. Mm -hmm. uh, or, um, I don't know, Evie said when she walked out last year, like the first one, she kind of was thrown off for squat. So it, it just depends on what type of personality you are. But in those different scenarios, like your training in the gym doesn't translate to the platform sometimes. So that's where I was like, okay, Sunita, like she hit 300, but I personally didn't think she'd be able to do that on the Sheffield stage. 
boy, was I wrong, <laughs> right? Like, holy shit, that was a spectacle of a lift, man. So there, yeah, you get, you get that egg thrown on your face. And I, I didn't think about it from that perspective, but uh, that's something that I'll learn once, once I'm not a rookie well, a, anymore. Well, it's a good thing though. Like it's also, cause you're brought in for analysis though. You were brought in specifically to break down things and whatever. So that's, you're, you're supposed to, you're setting them up for a hero moment is what they have to realize. Yeah. I am at times setting you up for a hero moment. Mm -hmm. I accept my role. Make me eat crow. That's fine. I'll have you on the re I'll, in the recap show. I'm going to give you your flowers. Don't worry. Or, and you could be on the podcast or um, in the commentary. If you hit it, I'm going to build you up. Like, Oh my God, who, who would have thought, you know, blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But that is our role though. We got to be able to, it, it's, it's, I know it's a, uh, it's tough, man, because people see us, around and and we yeah. develop friendships and you develop but at the same time i don't know to an extent i think people do respect what what we're trying to achieve here and it's got to be like other sports but it, for, for you uh, talking about it it was the wildest when uh you were doing the interviews and tell me your honest opinion when gavin aiden dropped that f-ball live <laughs> on the stream and i was like I was when he dropped it and I was in the commentary booth with all like all ever the sound technicians and yeah. all, whatever. And we were like, oh, oh, oh damn, there it is. Was, was gonna finally drop an F-bomb. I'm glad it wasn't me. <laughs> but uh, eventually someone's gonna swear. I think in all the years of commentating, it's live. Yeah. I don't know how many hours I've done. I've never sworn yet. Um, but how was your reaction? God damn, dude, this is day one for me, Playboy. What are you doing? <laughs> What do you do? What do you do? Well, you you handle it well. You did draw attention <laughs> to it. You said like you laughed and go, I love the I love the passion. I love the energy. And then yeah. you kept it moving. And then you kept it moving to the question. You handled it like a pro, but it it really internally, what were you thinking? Were you like, oh damn? <laughs> <laughs> so there was so we were in the the VIP section doing the interviews. So for those that didn't know, the VIP section was below the theater. So where where the crowd is, you you have to go like three or four stories below, and that's where the warm up room was um, for all the lifters. And then they have this little middle area that was for the VIP specifically after, where all the athletes get to sign and, and do stuff. But they also had the interview uh, stage there for Amelia and I. So we were doing everything and people were coming back and forth. So they like some people were stopping to watch, to listen to the live interviews um, that were actually you happening. Mean like, like, you, you mean like guests, like, like a yeah. fans? No, not fans, but like uh, other coaches. Okay. okay. Um, no, th we were still in the warm up area. There's no one out, okay, okay. no one down there without credentials. Like you had to be a coach, part of the staff, uh, media team. So, we were set up in this little corner, but people were coming back and forth, like the coaches, the athletes, so on and so forth. So some, some of them were coming by and uh, Ray, Gavin's handler, he he was in the background and he heard Gavin say, fuck. <laughs> and he started laughing. He was like, oh, so I saw his reaction. And we just, just lost Nike. I, <laughs> we just lost Nike. Ray goes, well, there goes Nike. <laughs> And I was I I wanted to start laughing like oh shit, um, but I I tried my best to keep like a straight face of like all right that we just that's the passion in it and I was like I love <laughs> I was like I love the energy I was like how you feeling going in the bench <laughs> yeah 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 love the and energy let's it, keep it moving yeah just keep love it moving <laughs> like yeah. I'm not gonna draw attention it's just it is what it is <laughs> right right yeah and it's I, uh. No, I, I knew going into it that the raw emotion was going to come out. Um, Pete also, he gave us like a whole like write-up. Again, you talk about professionalism, right? He gave us a whole write-up of like, look, don't grab someone. But we were we were all in a group chat of like talking scenarios after each lift of who we wanted to potentially come pick. Like we were we were debating on whether it was Jesus after he just broke raise a uh, world record squat or Gavin. And it's like the storyline just made sense for Gavin because he's, <laughs> we again, call a spade a spade. He can't hit depth to save his life. And he's, he's got his, his, uh, 
his lifts overturned, uh, which were controversial. Um, and it's just that third squat that just haunted him. So the story of, look, he just hit, he buried that squat. He just hit the world record. Carlos was, was on his ass um, about hitting it for a second attempt and this and that. So we wanted to capture that moment. And Pete was like, yeah, we got to get Gavin. So I was like, all right, I got to be prepared um, for any emotion because I know how he is. He's a very passionate guy. So, uh, yeah, like, you know, your audience, you know who you're you're interviewing. And we also did a great job of communication in, in our group chat of like, look, just be prepared. These are the questions that we want to ask. This is the breakdown that we want to give to the audience. So, yeah, shout out to Pete. Shout out to the media team or keeping us prepared on that and being i've done that i've done the interviews for ipf worlds i think it was 2018 actually and some of them it, it helps to have a good team behind you if you're when it just concludes and you're like what questions can i ask here and mm -hmm. they fire you a couple off the top especially i remember ray williams had won for the umpteenth time i think it was his fifth and it wasn't particularly close and I was like, I wasn't too sure. There wasn't a lot of storylines. And I'm like, what do you guys think? What do we got here? I got 60 seconds to come up with some questions, but like good questions. And they were like, look at sometimes certain a storyline didn't develop. He's done it time and time and again. Just be like, this is your fifth. Does this, how does this one stack up to the others? Or how do you keep the motivation going when, when you keep winning? And then it's this opportunity to be like, you know, I'm trying to build a legacy or, you know, this was the best one or, you know, nothing equals the first, but, and then from there you snowball, but sometimes it's just like, get me the ball rolling here. What yeah. do I do? And, and it's good to have a team to be like, start with this actively listen for a follow-up. The difference is one of the, and tell me what you thought about this. One of the hardest parts when you're podcasting, I can actively listen to what you're saying come back, back, we go back and forth, it's easy. But when you have literally 60 seconds mm -hmm. and you can't necessarily do that, sometimes it's, I'm going to ask you a question, get the answer, and I got to real Next quick question. turn yeah. on, or I got to keep you moving because this isn't a podcast and you're chewing up too much time. Mm -hmm. And I almost got to find my, you know, it's it's different. It's actually harder for, in a lot of ways to be like, I need three hard questions, quick, fast, concise. I need to say them. You give me the answer and I cut like I don't want to cut you off, but it's got to find I got to acknowledge what you said and then move on. It's different, is it not? It's because it's not a conversation. No, it's 100 percent. And I actually had to uh, come up with those questions. And and there were storylines that were emerging that weren't on the script that we previously had. So mm. uh, Agatha, for example, I I got her after bench and she had she opened up with the world record. And I was like, I was blown away that she was doing what she was doing. Like she had after bench, she was like up 6% over the world record already. And I was like, you're in the driver's seat. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. I wasn't expecting that leading into, I, I was thinking that like four or 5% was going to win on the women's side. And here we are coming out of bench at 6%. And Leah right behind her at like above five percent. So I'm I'm like, we're seeing something that <laughs> we haven't seen or at least expected. So it changes the questions because I had I had uh, predetermined questions that I was going to ask. Um, but then like once the story started to develop a little differently, you have to shake and jive, um, and and switch up that script really quick. And they wanted to do it immediately after they were finished. So you don't have much time to switch those questions uh, and come up with the storyline itself. So I was like glued to the TV screen of like, mm -hmm. all right, what's happening? This is how this is how it's shaking out. Uh, Pete was also like giving different updates of like, hey, we can hit on these points and blah, blah, blah. So uh, it took a it took a team for sure to get out how what we wanted to say um on the live stream but when you get thrown curveballs like gavin cursing or they make a good point in the answer that they're giving it kind of leads into maybe leads you into another question that you weren't prepared to ask uh mm. which happened to me and Gu uh, gustav after he won um that like i had a i had a whole script that i was going to go through but then like he was giving like these uh 
very short answers and I wasn't prepared for that. So I was kind of just feeding off of him. Um, I, I kind of, I was trying to take him in the direction that I wanted him to go, but he wasn't taking the bait. So I had to switch up some of the questions that I wanted to ask him. Um, so yeah, it's, it was completely different. It, it's a different skill set in the moment uh, and it's live. So yes, that that's another thing where you, you have to, uh, and I'll, I'll get better at this as well, but, um, not stumbling over your words, being quick, concise, getting to the answer that you want. Um, and then leading on very quickly, like Gavin, he was, he was a long, he was long winded with his answers. So I only asked him two questions. Uh, I had like four or five lined up though, just in case. So Mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of where, you you have to figure out know your audience know how much time is on the clock you have that internal clock as well um but yeah it's it's a different skill set for sure it's one of the one of the things that you'll get used to more and more and more like i remember 2016 17 like how much learn you learned along the way in yeah. 18 like even now i'm still learning stuff cuz as we expand and our roles expand but one of the things is um, sometimes silence is okay. What we do is if you say something, I'll acknowledge. I'm like, right, right. And then I ask, and then pretty soon you'll start being like, you'll say, especially in certain roles, you'll say something. I don't say anything. What about in the second when in the second for bench, when you, and then you'll say something when it came to deadlifts and it's not normal to speak like that. That's mm-hmm. not normal conversation to not acknowledge what you just said. But when you have two minutes right afterwards, um, what you notice is in broadcasting, you don't acknowledge. You don't say, right, right, or gotcha, gotcha. Right. You don't. You do in real life. And you think it's actually rude not to. And in, in real life, it's it's a confirmation that you're, you know, of the point. But in that role, you actually just, um, and it feels weird and people aren't going to know until you're in that. And it feel it, it to just leave it dead air, hear exactly what you're saying, and then just completely drop it and go into a second question with no tie-in wording at all. It's mm-hmm. not natural at all to do that. Mm-hmm. But you're gonna start doing that to the point where it's like, Taylor, tell me about your squat, your third squat. Did you feel it was depth this time? And then when you hit it, um, and, and you could give an answer or whatever, and I don't say anything back, and I'm like, going into the bench press, mm-hmm. and I just go into it. And I don't give an acknowledgement, right, right, or I don't give an, or I, nothing. And I'm just waiting for you to finish, and I'm already ready. When you hit that final deadlift, did you think it was enough? And it doesn't matter what you just told me about the bench. And I hit my shit, and then drop it and go. Mm -hmm. Then I turn to you and go, and back to you, Ryan. And that's when it gets tight. And you'll start getting tighter, tighter, tighter. And people think like it's, people watch this, and they don't, uh, realize we're all growing into roles, figuring things out. Literally, none of us have done that. <laughs> Literally, just all of us now are like, I guess Sheffield were doing this. I guess Sheffield were doing a preview for vendors. I guess Sheffield right. were doing, you know, and um, we're tidying. <laughs> look at from first Sheffield to second Sheffield to we're tidying things up and finding our way. And uh, some people are getting thrown into roles like previously, like I was lucky enough to have had media training because I, I was on a reality TV show. So they told me these kind of things where it's like when you're asking questions and you we're moving quick, bang, boom, boom. It's not going to feel natural. It's going to feel awkward. You're going to feel like you're being bully pushy to the person. And it's not how you talk. Mm-hmm. It's, it goes against normal social skills, but you like do it. Yep. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> All right. And then when you see it afterwards, you're like, I don't want to, I know why I got, you. they are doing that. <laughs> and when you watch sports now, you'll be like, that's what they I do. I get it. Oh, that is what they do. Isn't it? It's like, yeah, yeah. They're honestly, sometimes not even giving a fuck what you're saying. That That's so true, man. And you know, I, I listen to the senior leaders speak as well at my company at like a Ted talk, for example. And I'm like, man, they sound like a robot, but it, it like to the that's just me but to the audience that that is how you need to speak to an audience Mm. there's different tonalities there's a pause there's emphasis in something that you're saying your tone changes when you're trying to emphasize 
And that's what I'm learning as well is, is having that skill set of knowing when to pause, knowing not to over talk anyone. How do you handle someone when they're language barrier, for example? Um, yeah, it's, it's just a different skill set, but I like, I'm starting to learn that you have to, when you're talking to a big audience, that is what you're, that's what they're used to. And it's not innate. It's, it's not natural to us. And we have to learn that. And that's something that we have to build in our skill set. And I'm actually taking a few presentation classes to work on that as well. Um, nice. just, so there's uh yeah, I, I look, I'm in the latter half of my, my powerlifting career and we've, t we've talked about this, but we can talk about it on the podcast. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm in the latter half. I, I want to be a part of powerlifting even when I'm not at my peak anymore. And the next best thing is, is commentation. It just is. So being able to bring my experience now into that realm, um, and being considered one of the best, I think it's, it's a unique, uh, opportunity for myself and for anyone else that has me as a commentator. Uh, they, they get to hear it from someone that's experienced it, that has been on the biggest stages in powerlifting, um, and have, has gone through every, I think, <laughs> emotion you could think of. Like I've lost the world championship. I've won a world championship. I've been the best in, in that moment. I'm considered one of the best ever to do it. So like to bring those experiences to the table uh, is, is unique. And I want to give back to the community that has given me so much. And that's the next best thing I think I can do. Um, so again, man, I just appreciate SBD for, for bringing me out. Yeah. I mean, um, one more thing and I'll close the book on that one piece, but every single different role, some people don't realize how different they are, how you talk in a quick paced interview to how you talk as a lead, to how you talk as a co, to how you talk on a podcast, to how you talk in an in a, analytics role before, to how you talk in a presentation is all different. And I think some people think it's all the same and they, that is where they're the same person every time. And they don't know. And that is the learning curve. Everyone's <laughs> going to have with media training will get you there. Or you just learn on the fly. Yeah. I I've been through some of this. So I will, um, if I know certain people are doing certain roles, I will tell them if they ask me, but I don't want to overstep either. Be like, <laughs> here are some notes. If you're going to do quick fire interviews, there, here's a couple notes I would give if you can do commentary, co or lead. I'm, I'm like, co or lead, and make sure you know which one or, yeah. or whatever. What you know, even the lady when it came to like public speaking, and I was like, if it's motivational, you live in the pause and you stretch out words, like, especially in the story. Don't rush, don't rush <laughs> your stat, your, your story, <laughs> you know, don't, whatever. Be comfortable in that. Um, but but, anyways, yeah, and I think as, as a sport, as we grow, more and more people are gonna get comfortable in these zones. And I do like, you know, you speaking to um yourself, like as a, as an athlete at 35, well, period for all athletes, your athletic prime, all people's, all athletes, athletic prime are going to be yay many years, but media and broadcast and all of that could be literally, you have guys who have done like baseball. Some people watched the same baseball broadcaster when they were a kid. And then with their kids, they watch the same guy. And then now that they're grandma and grandpa, it's the same dude. And then he passes away damn near in the chair and he's in the hall of fame, like sports broadcast. I mean, that's why they have like Joe Rogan for like 30 years has been doing the UFC. Like, but that's just not Rogan. It's all sports. When you, in terms of what you can do there, in terms of the lifespan and the experiences you'll have and be all over the world, meet so many people have so many it can go on forever. I, I haven't been around that long. Like for our sport, it's long. 2016 was my first year in the broadcast side, but um, the amount of people I've seen come and go, but you you'll stay and you get to keep experiencing it. You know, you're it's a, it's an, it's a, it's a door that um, yeah, I don't take that for granted, man. I'm like, yeah. Oh my God. And 
this is crazy. We're doing this. You were around 2016. I just made a post where mm -hmm. it was a video that White Lights did a quick interview with me and they took a snippet and I posted it in the King of Lists. It was just like a two second part snippet where I'm like, they were like, how do you feel? How crazy is this? And they just grabbed me after there was like a queue of people wanting pictures with me while at the back of the booth in commentating booth. And I'm like, I hop out and I'm taking pics and I'm like, this is crazy. This is crazy, man. What? And they're all like, I listen to the podcast. Holy crap. I can't believe you're here. And I'm like, I can't believe you. You're like, this is, I can't believe you're waiting for a picture with me. And they were, so then white lights, that's when white lights grabbed me for that quick interview. and was like, um, what is this experience like for you? And I said, dude, I can't believe people are lining up to tell me about like, to talk to me like that. And I can't believe we're here. There's thousands of people yelling and I can't believe we're doing what we're doing. I'm like, if this is a dream, don't pinch me. Don't wake me up. Yeah. This is crazy. And back in, back in the day, this was all a dream. And here we are. And I was talking to Randy cook, whom just yesterday, whom, was the original co-host for King of the List. When you were first on way back in the day, it yeah. was me and Randy. And then Randy, you know, like normal life came in and he ended up doing his damn thing with all of that. Me and Randy still talk and everything, but he went off doing that. And now I talk to him and he's like, dude, because he still follows King of the List and pays attention. He's like, I can't believe now how weird it is to see you're at Sheffield and people you're reposting people be like, I met six pack lap and he's like, what, what the shit? This is crazy. And like all the, what, what our streams look like now and like the CBS deal and then Eurosport and being like, what, what does this mean? I'm going to be a sports commentator on CBS. This is the fucking Super Bowl, bro. I'm going to be on CBS sports commentator on Eurosport and all that. Like these, all of this is surreal. And he's like, talking to someone who bowed out earlier for him to come back and be like, dude, do you, do you remember when we talked back in the day, what mm -hmm. our dreams would be if we were in this, then we were in that. And do you remember talking like, who knows I'm commentating powerlifting? Who knows if like in the future, <laughs> I'll commentate um, sports on TV. Now you'll commentate powerlifting on TV playboy. You right. know what I mean? like, who knows what doors open up and who knows in 10 years, but it's crazy. Yeah, everyone uh, is like, the IPF won't make it to the Olympics. It's like, dude, at this point, who cares about the Olympics? Like, we got the Sheffield. <laughs> we got social media. We have people that have way bigger reaches um, across all platforms, like YouTube, TikTok, Instagram. And their audience itself is bringing more eyes than... I think us being in the Olympics, not saying it would still be an honor to be a part of the Olympics. Like, don't get me wrong. Um, but if we just keep hanging our hat on like, oh, we'll make it to the Olympics. It's like, just live in the moment, man, right now, because mm. we are at a special place where we are pivoting into a direction that I don't think we even knew as a, a community would be available to us right now. And we we're doubling down again. We we got streamed on the Olympic Channel, but the Eurosport deal, the CBS Sport deal, like this shit is happening. It's happening, and we can deny it all we want, and we can play pessimist all we want, but we got to live this shit up, and we have to make this a big deal because it is. It is a big deal, and when people say that this is just powerlifting, it's not just powerlifting anymore. You have multi-million, billion dollar companies entering this realm in space. That CBS sport deal, that's a billion, multi-billion dollar company, people. That's a huge fucking deal. So stop saying powerlifting is just a hobby. It's not anymore. It's the real deal. You got companies paying these athletes to work out and make it a full-time job now. So let's let's stop kidding ourselves. We're a real fucking sport. And I'm tired of these people talking down on powerlifting. Like I have people that hate on me because I'm still posting about powerlifting and shit that knew me back in Rochester, Minnesota. I'm like, dude, that was nine years ago, homie. <laughs> like <laughs> it, we we've grown a lot bigger than that, my man. Um, so for 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 people that don't understand our community, that's fine. We're gonna get there. We're going to get there. Not everyone knew about MMA. Not everyone yeah. knew about the UFC. 
and here here they are. Not only okay, so millions and millions and millions of people are going to see us on CBS, Eurosport, etc. This is where when you have people's attention, you don't know what's going to come of it. You don't know who's going to watch and be mm-hmm. like, oh my God, if they watch the battle of the 74s, the battle of the 93s or whatever, 84 pluses. And they're like, oh my God, I didn't think it'd be that entertaining. All you need is one person, the right person. Mm-hmm. All you need is the right person. I'm telling you, when I got on that reality TV show, I sent 300 emails to 300 different contacts I found online who were TV production companies. Man. I got one reply. One out of 300. 299 notes. Wow. 299. And I just kept going. I had an Excel spreadsheet and I would find the company, find the emails and contacts and put a check, check, check. And every day I would just send more, send more, send more. And I put together a package of me and I'd send it every fucking day. Good for and then you, man. one out of 300, one said, we'll allow you to audition. Wow. And it's a four day audition. And so my point is when you, when you throw yourself out there and it's like a CBS deal, what is, what's going to come of it? I don't know. All I know is millions of people are going to watch mm-hmm. what brands are watching, what TV execs are watching, what, if 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 somebody if we're being denied, let's let's talk about Olympics. If we're being denied that, would the Olympics or whoever's watching the Olympics, if they don't know powerlifting, what if they finally someone does tune in right. and is like, oh shit? And what if what if they're like, wait a minute, these guys are on Eurosports, CBS, the Olympic Channel. I just I just saw that they have an event like Sheffield. Let me see what the hell that's all about. Then they watch Sheffield and they're like, holy shit! Mm-hmm. Now all of a sudden their wheels are turning. But you got to keep adding and keep moving and be like, how do we get people's attention? How do we get people outside of our, our reach that we already have? Who knows who's going to watch? Who knows? Right. You got to try though. You got to push. You got to kick doors down. The squeaky wheel gets the grease, man. Let's go. And, right. and people say, like, sometimes we talk as though to have the Olympics mean we don't have Sheffield. No, let's have both. That's what boxing has. You go to the Olympics, you turn pro and you sign a deal with freaking you know, all these massive boxing promotions, you can go to the Olympics, do your damn thing, and then come out and have Sheffield. Like, we let's have it all. Yeah. Why? Why can't we have it all? Like, who says, <laughs> you know, we can. We're allowed to. Why let's not? get greedy. Let's get, yeah. let's spread. Let's spread out. And I SBD agree. and um, is doing a phenomenal job and keep doing others. And then we're, we're the IPF itself can move in one direction. SBD can move in another. And let's see what the hell happens, man. But uh, I don't know, man. I'm excited. I'm glad. I mean, you paid your damn dues. I'm glad you're you're adapting into your role nicely and and saying yes <laughs> and showing up. I told you, say yes whenever say possible. Say yes. That's right. Say always say yes. Figure it out after the fact. You can you can do that. Um, but for yourself, so you had made an announcement leading at the Sheffield. Not only that, like the Pete. Okay, I'm not going to be able to be a reserve. But recently, you said your plans for 2024. So mm-hmm. give us an update on how the injuries are feeling, your plans, et cetera. Yeah, so ah, here we go. Um, I officially announced I'm not doing PA Nats, which is in like two weeks, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I I told Pete, I tried to get him before I announced it on social media because I think uh, as a sponsor, SPD sponsors me, Um I have to give them updates as to like what my plans are, if anything material changes in terms of competing. So I tried to get him early, but I I couldn't. And I announced it. Uh, Yeah. This 2023, I I wrote this down because I I don't want to uh, deviate (laughs) from what what I've said. Um, you you could read us the post if you want. Like, I wouldn't mind. Yeah, I no. So, yeah, the post actually said this was it was one of the hardest. This, this is one of the hardest decisions I've had to make in a very long time. But I have decided not to compete at Powerlifting America Raw Nationals 2024. I know you were hoping to see me compete, but I'm choosing a different path to achieve my goals for this year. 2023 redefined my perspective on success and what I want my legacy to be, a new era 
begins. And <laughs> I like how it, I like how it ended on a positive note. A new era begins. And I I I spoke to my coaches. I think you saw I was with my my team in Sheffield. Mm-hmm. Uh I had first and foremost my pops. My dad was there. Uh Jason, who's my my strength coach, Ben, who's my strength coach. I get coached by both of them. And then my nutritionist Kedrick. And we like Kedrick, he's not, he hasn't been just my nutritionist. Like he's, he started out with TSG as an intern. So he actually started with Jason. Um, and Jason was essentially like coaching me, but having Kedrick watch what he was doing with me as well. So Kedrick and I go way back before that. So it was only right to bring him in, not just, you got a cat? Oh, shit. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I I wanted to ensure that he was a part of this discussion and keep him involved because he deserves it. Um, he's been there since the beginning. And even though he, he separated from TSG, started his own company uh, with Reformance, and he's doing phenomenal things, I still wanted him to be a part of that uh, discussion. So we decided not to go through with PA Nats just because again, my, I think I released my PRP video right before I had announced that I wasn't doing nationals, but I had already made the decision that I wasn't doing nationals. And I wanted people to have context before any speculation started coming out. So when I released my PRP video, I said it had taken me four months to really get back to a good baseline and training has been going phenomenal actually so i'm i'm healthy knock on wood 100 healthy now uh knee is feeling phenomenal i'm just not at a point where i think i would be at 850 plus in the 74 class i'm just not there and i Learned the hard way last year by losing Sheffield, losing Worlds, and not getting selected to 2024 Sheffield for the wild card, that success for me had to change because that's what I was resting my laurels on was like, I'm a winner. That's all I do is I fucking win. I hadn't lost since since 2017. Like... (laughs) That's that's a long time to not lose and then finally lose again. It was just, there were things that I had to redefine. And given that I'm older, I'm a dad now, a uh, husband, I'm a, a, a friend, a son. My perspective has changed. So I've had to just think about what I wanted my legacy to continue to be because after losing, I still had my, my team Atwood for me, but it also like 2023 was one of the worst years of my life. I'm not, and that wasn't just powerlifting. That was life. Big part of it was powerlifting though. And I had to, everyone wanted to kick me when I kick a dog while they were down. Right. Like it was just like one thing after the next. And you saw people like pile on, they piled on and don't worry. I kept receipts. <laughs> I, I, I did. Don't worry. Um, but it's, it, it was just a, a decision I had to make that I didn't want my legacy to continue to get tarnished because I'm not a hundred and, 10% or the Taylor Atwood that everyone knows from 2021. So I have, I had to make a tough decision and just say, look, I had to compete coming out of Sheffield last year because I wanted to go to Sheffield in 2024, like and get redemption for losing in 2023. Like that, that's the, that was the only reason I competed at worlds. Uh, Pete, I was like, because I talked to Pete before Worlds and, and and told him that like, look, I'm 
highly, highly considering pulling out of Worlds. However, what are the chances of me getting a wild card spot? And he was like, look, I can't promise you anything. And at that point, I was like, all right, there's no loyalty in this. <laughs> so even though I'm a tier one athlete, it doesn't fucking matter. Like you still have to earn it just like everyone else. And I was like, all right, fuck it. It's on. Let's do it. So that was the only reason, because otherwise I would have pulled out of Worlds. If I would have known I had a, a, a shot at going to NAPF and um, competing there and, and then getting the wild card spot. Like I would, that's the route I would have taken. Cause I just needed one more month. If I had one more month of training, there would have been zero question on squat and deadlift, zero question. So I would have been well above 800 in total. So I just needed time on my side, which I didn't have. And I lost. And unfortunately, that's not the legacy that I want to leave. It's not the legacy that people have followed me for. They deserve more from me. And I'm not going to sit here and, and be delusional with myself and think that I'm going into a competition when I'm not 110% thinking I'm going to win. Because I, that's how I felt leading into Sheffield and Worlds. And it was the worst fucking feeling ever. Knowing that I, I, I'm not confident. I don't know if I'm going to win. Like, I don't, I had never, even when I've lost in 2016 and 2017, I didn't go in thinking I was going to lose. The, like Sheffield and Worlds were the really only time I had some doubt in, in my mind that I am probably not going to win. Or at least I don't have as much of a chance as I've had in the past. So I've had to, again, redefine what I want my legacy to be, and losing is not a part of it. So the only way to continue the legacy that I want to build, which is to be a winner, is to get back 110% healthy. I had to be selfish um, and, and, and not play on anyone else's calendar except mine. Because again, it's just the way that the cookie crumbled last year with Sheffield being in March and then World in June. I just had to, I didn't have much turnaround time coming out of Sheffield to train. So I was like, look, I told Jason, I told my dad, told Ben, told Kedrick, you know, coming out of the pandemic, I think the, and, and coming into 2021 when I hit my best total. They were like, how did you get there? And I was like, I didn't have this pressure of competing. We like during the pandemic, I had from February when everything went in lockdown mode in the US until August. And we decided to compete in August just on a whim. It was what we weren't even supposed to compete. But that's when I hit my 812 total. I finally hit the 800 barrier. Um, but I didn't have this pressure of competing. Like I, I, Coming out of February, we didn't know what the fuck was happening. So I got to go into the gym by myself because the gym was locked down. No one was there. And I got to just put my fucking headphones in and just grind my ass off and just train to train. And when that happened, you guys saw a different Taylor Atwood emerge. So that's where the decision kind of came in for this year. I don't want the like pressure of competing again when I'm not 110%. And I didn't have a, again, time wasn't on my side with the rehab. <clears throat> I just started feeling good again and probably like beginning of January, mid January. So I've really only had like 10 weeks of, of really good training, uninterrupted training, but we're still training at sub maximal loads. It's it, like, if I had to start peaking right now, I'm not, there, there's no way I'm, I, I'd be ready. And I'm not doing that again. I'm not tarnishing my legacy and allowing someone to beat me when I'm not 110%. Now, that brings me to my my next point. Um, and again, this is, this I, I wrote it down because I just want the message 
to be reciprocated and, and received well. So, you know, after lo losing Sheffield in, in Worlds last year and then not receiving that wild card spot mm -hmm. spot in uh, for Sheffield 2024, again, my definition of success changed, right? And I'd be a hypocrite if I didn't mention the fact that I didn't consider myself a world champion in 2018 when Shell beat me in Baylor Ruse in 2017. Um, and he didn't show up to Calgary in 2018 and I won. Uh, and, but he showed up in 2019 and he was hurt. And But I, I didn't care. It was like, I knew that on that day, he, even at his best, he wasn't going to beat me. So like there was like this 2019... It was finally, I hit that 790 and a half total. We're knocking on the 800 barrier at 74. Like no one even thought that was even fucking like fathomable back then. So what I, I, I've heard Austin say that he's upset that I'm not competing and I understand where he's coming from. And I'd be remiss if I didn't say like, I know, I know how you're feeling right now, Austin. Uh, I felt like that back in 2018. Um, However, this is my journey, my journey, Taylor Atwood's journey. And again, my perspective of, of competition, uh, it's changed. And I've been in the game now for 10 years. And I'm, I've, I've been able to, to mature as a person, as a competitor. And I've, I've realized now that after losing in, in 2023, like this journey I'm on, it's it's bigger than than one battle and it's bigger than one person. So what I how I'm going to end this segment is just I'm still going to be competing. Like that's that's a done deal. Like that's the that's the plan here in 2024. I'm still competing, but I'm competing on my terms. I'm not competing on anyone else's terms. And I'm focused on me and me only. And I'm selfish. I'm I'm going to continue to say that because I don't want anyone to think that, oh, he's not doing it because like, I know you all wanted to see a battle between me and Austin. I know Austin wanted to battle against me, but I like, I have to do what's best for me. I'm not doing what's best for anyone else anymore. And you're just going to have to keep following this journey and see how it plays out. But I can promise you one thing, and I'll promise you all one thing. I will be back on top. Um, that's that's how you got ahead to for sure. But um, I, I totally get where you're coming from, where it's you'll feel pressure to, well, give us this, give us that, give us this showdown, give us in where you're like, listen to me, I want to give you what you want, but I am underperforming and you guys know it. The total I put up at Sheffield, the total I put up at Worlds, you guys know that's not my best totals. You want me at my best. You all do. Do you want me just to step up and give you a showdown at what cost just so I can, when I know I'm not at the best, you know I'm not just because my name's Taylor Atwood. The name I helped build to be Taylor Atwood is why you're asking for it but it's not going to help the name brand. If I keep doing this, I know what you mean where it's like, let me just gather myself and give you the best I can. Mm -hmm. You know, let me just give you the best I can as a 35 year old, 10 year veteran. Let me give you at least, let me give you that. Mm -hmm. And we'll all be a lot happier if we just have a little bit of patience. Otherwise, and some people, I think you're one Emerson, right? Don't give a shit. If you're at your best. Some people want you just to show up so they can be like, yeah, that's what I thought. It's like, yeah, all right. Well, you know what I mean? Where it's like, I'm not doing that for you. You know? Man, they, that's... Want it. they couldn't care less if you don't, if you underperform. It's even better for some people. Like, I, I, I read some comments <clears throat> about like, they're like, oh, what's he talking about legacy? Like, you want to build a legacy knowing that you went out on your shield. Look, I'm not Gavin. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, I'm, uh, props to gavin man like he talks about all he wants to do is go out onto the platform he doesn't give a shit if he wins or not and that's his brand that's how he builds his his thing but that's not taylor atwood that's not who i am that's not the brand that i've built 
I've built the brand, the guys that, that follow me, the women that follow me, the people that follow me, the companies that sponsor me, they sponsored me because of what I brought to the table as a champion. It says three-time world champion on my Instagram. It's the first thing that you see because that's what I want everyone to know who comes onto my page. That's who you're following. You're following a world champion. And it took a lot of fucking work to get to be that, to get to that status. And I'm not going to allow my legacy of that world champion status to continue to be tarnished because I'm not 110% and I'm not at the level that I know I'm capable of performing at. And to your point, man, like it just, that's the, that's not the legacy that I want. I'm not going to go on my shield and just continue to compete less than a hundred percent. I'm just not doing it. And you can say I'm ducking and dodging, whatever you want. I, I really don't give a shit. I, this is my journey. It's not yours. You're a spectator. There's only been 24 men and women that have been able to call themselves Sheffield participants. Are you a part of that? <laughs> Will you ever be a part of that? So I, like you all can sit in the cheap seats and throw popcorn. <laughs> that's, that's where you're at, but I'm not going to continue to be like it. it 24 that's it 24 and even then it's not uh because we had people coming back uh for their second sheffield so it's that's less right. than 24 uh, i don't i don't know the number but it's less than 20 people maybe less than 15 that can call themselves sheffield participants and like you talk about being the one percent of the one percent you can keep talking all you want, but that's all you're going to be doing is talking. And I'm going to continue to be Taylor Atwood and who I want to be as that champion. Um, but I know what it takes to get back there. I just need time. I just need time. That's it. Just give me some time. I promise you, I promise you the one promise that I, 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 I just know without a shadow of a doubt, man, I'm, I envision it every day. I'm visioning it. I'm talking about it. I'm thinking about it. I'm strategizing to get back to being the best. And I promise you, I will get back there. I feel like you've at least, okay. Well, first off, you showed up at Sheffield or injured. You showed up at world injured. You've done that. If they're saying like, you got to go out on your shield. What the hell? <laughs> right. You would be like, bro, I did, I, it. <laughs> I did it twice in a row. <laughs> In a lot of, a lot of, I mean, you know, some people were talking shit, but other people were like, hats off. The guy showed up, did his damn thing. And if you're going to take it from yeah. him, you have yeah. to take it from him. He's yeah. not laying down. You did do that. You did be like, I'm not hundred percent. I'm showing up. You got to take it for me. And you just didn't give it up. So they should recognize that two times in a row. Yeah. Yeah. Well, some people are going to talk shit regardless. And yeah. then um, also, so I'm curious as to what 2024 will look like, like if you are going to compete, mm -hmm. what would you be targeting and what weight class? Because here's something, even if you don't want to campaign as an 83, mm -hmm. during your recovery mode, during the year off, quote, 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 unquote, where you will be competing, but you're not trying to make a world team. You're not trying to, does cutting even make sense? Or can you, or would you just be like, okay, during my recovery year where I'm just competing to compete, I'm just competing to be strong and healthy. I'm competing to get some numbers out. Mm -hmm. Do you just not care where your body weight's at? You'll be a small 83. You're not gassing up to be a big baby, like a, getting bigger to be, no, gassing up's not the right word to use, but um, <laughs> you're not, you're not eating up and bulking up to make a, to make a run at 83, but you just be like, I'm going to let my body be yeah. wherever it's going to be. No, that's a great question. Um, good segue to. So yeah, that's 100% part of the plan. I'm not watching my weight currently. Uh, a lot of people were commenting that I look big um, on the the Sheffield. Hey, I, I ain't fat shame you. <laughs> I, you look good to me, King. <laughs> no, that, that like I got I got good compliments. Like yo, you you look full. Um, but I, I <laughs> you're, you're like, like easy. I'm like easy. Hey, hey. we're coming out of the, like, we're coming out stop. of winter. Hey, stop hyping me up, man. Stop me <laughs> you're up, like, yeah. Yo. <laughs> um, no, we've been doing a lot of hypertrophy on the upper body as well. Like that's part of our our programming is we're doing a lot of rehab and prehab exercises. 
one of them being shoulders because coming into Sheffield 2023, I had some pec tendon issues. So one of the things that we really wanted to focus on when I had my PRP, I wasn't able to squat or deadlift for almost like 10 weeks, man. Oh, like wow. le at less than 50%. Yeah. Like that was, if you listen to my PRP video, I was, I was the re the doctor told me not to squat or put any type of pressure that would screw up that new biology that is being created. They didn't want me to do anything above 50% for like eight to 10 weeks. So that's, that's kind of what was happening. I was still squatting, still keeping my neuro patterns there, but they were really just body weight squats and and not doing anything crazy. Uh, but we really hit it hard on the hypertrophy on upper body. So when you guys are like, yo, you look full, like I, I appreciate that because I've been putting a lot of fucking work into my upper body and shoulders. Um, and I told Jason that I, my coach want, I want to like look like a bodybuilder essentially. So that's kind of what training has looked like. And we're continuing to do that. So when you guys start to see like, damn, your arms are looking bigger or whatever it may be, it's like, all right, the the program's working. <laughs> I appreciate it. Do a bodybuilding. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, this year, I I don't know when I'm competing. That's that's still up in the air. There's a few things that I have my eyes on, um, but they haven't come to fruition yet, and I can't talk about them just yet, but I will in due time. But uh, in terms of weight, I'm, yeah, like talking with Kedrick, given that he is my nutritionist and talking as a team, we just think currently with health, uh, put leaving on some body weight, no, knowing that we don't have to compete anytime soon. We don't have to stay because I don't walk, I don't walk around maybe like two kilos above my weight class. So 70, 76. So it's not like my, my cut is, is literally like gut manipulation. That's it. Um, so I, I, I'm just going to focus on eating however I want, uh, just staying healthy, having, and, and putting together good strings of training macro cycles throughout the year. And if we can continue on the trajectory that we're on right now, we got some big numbers ahead of us. Do you, yeah, well, I mean, to an extent too, like obviously calories is the gas, you know, yeah. that's the, the energy. And if you could just, and especially when you're recovering from injury and the body's trying to repair, you give it all the nutrients it needs. Cutting is like the opposite. Um, even yeah. if, even if you don't have to cut a lot, if you eat more than you're used to, you know, and, and just put more calories in than you're used to, let me get rid of this. <laughs> um, i saw i saw his claw yeah it was like get the hell out of here <laughs> but uh it'll it'll help in terms this is the perfect year just to focus on things because you're not if you look at it as i'm not competing i'm just trying to be the best me i'm just trying to get on track mm -hmm. so let me eat as much as i need to recover mm -hmm. and let me walk in there not worrying about body weight because i'm not trying to compare myself to anyone else as a matter of fact if i'm a small 83 i'm neither an 83 nor 74 good then you're not comparing me to an 83 or 74s. Right. Because when you look at other 83s, you'll be like, yeah, he's way smaller than Russ and the other 83s. And then when you look at me, other 74s, you'll be like, yeah, he's not even cutting. He's just showing up, uh, having fun, put up numbers. That's good. Make your in-between Atwood weight. Yeah. So you are dancing to your own beat. Because this year is that. It's almost perfect to do to move in that lane. Um. So, and, and in terms of like what competition, whatever, We'll see what SBD's got going, but yeah, it's I don't know what's happening yet. I, I would love the opportunity to compete at a meet that qualifies me for Sheffield 2025. But I just don't know what that meet is yet or would be. So if it's not Sheffield 2025 that I'm trying to campaign for, then most likely, most likely, it's just a local meet somewhere and getting ready for PA Nats next year. But that's it. That like I just I'm trying I'm tr I'm figuring it out. I don't know what that is. Um, I don't know what route I can take. I don't know what meets will pop up. Um, 
I have an idea. I've had people reach out and tell me certain things may happen, blah, blah, blah. I just, I just don't know yet. So mm. I'll know, I'll know after PA Nats, I'll know more after Worlds, and then uh, we can start making some moves. But for now, I'm just going to continue to, to focus on me, focus on me only and train to the best of my ability at the weight that I want to train at, uh, body weight and just get stronger. That's, that's what I want. So, I mean, who really knows where you'll, you'll end up like you're, you're looking at probably the last quarter of 2024, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It'll be sometime October or later. So there's, there's always meets that like at, not only SVD, obviously, but SVD is doing meets, money meets, et cetera, that are like very high. They, they flew me in and in that in to do the commentary for the one they had in the fall in Texas. Um, yeah. And the, when SVD gets involved, the live streams are like top shelf. PA Nats well, worthy. Has Pete told you anything? About like what the other meets will be doing? Like this year? They're doing several other meets yeah. this year. Um, I mean, they're even doing, they're, they're up in Canada doing the Canadian Westerns and flying me out to do the commentary for that. So there's, there's a bunch. Are you doing the you one know, in July in, in Charlotte? Uh, because there's also Silent Worker in France that I do. I'd have to see because there's Worlds in June, Silent Worker in July. I'd have to see all the timetables for them all. I might be going to Silent Worker. I'm not going to compete, but I might be going. Well, there's, there's Silent Worker also in December. And that's the one that had like 700 people. I don't know if you saw the video. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was wild. I mean, it's the same atmosphere. It's like a smaller Sheffield in terms of amount of people, but they're wild like Sheffield. They're yeah. wild like that. In France, it's got a little sweet tooth for you too. So for, if you were to pick, if you were to pick a meet, if you did it in Silent Worker was the return of Taylor Atwood, I think they would receive <laughs> you very well. And I, I mean, think that would it be would, dope. That'd be dope. And it's December, so... You have all year to recover, be at your best, whatever body weight you want to be. And I mean, you know how Silent Worker puts on meets too. It's yeah. top end, top shelf stuff. Uh, Silent Worker, and that's Penn and the team is SBD France as well. So yeah, it's, it's yeah, you got time. You see, got see time. what pops up. And in terms of qualifications for different things, I know NAPF, we'll see what they sanction. We'll see what SBD yeah. holds and if they do any NAPF sanctioned meets or or what my or what have you. Um, I can't try to get my attention again. Yeah, Never mind. Uh, but hold on one sec. Let me put this on. <laughs> okay, I was just telling you that how in 2023 it was like you were given. You were saying how, and you said earlier in the podcast, but you're saying how it was like extremely difficult, and mm -hmm. and you were going through it. And I was saying how you were given an exam. And you had to pass some tests and you were given, it was questions that you previously did not have to ask yourself. And previously, like you were getting, it was like a full audit on yourself. And it was extremely difficult to finally lose at Worlds. And you passed it by not reacting emotionally and just congratulating Carl and waiting a month before you said your story. Because you knew like, hey, you like a lot of people, had some questions on the calls that were made against you and blah, blah, blah. And, but you also knew if I do this right now, it's going to take a little bit away from Carl and blah, blah, blah. And I don't want this to be a freaking storyline. Let me just relax. Let a month pass and I'll say my piece and we could debate that. And other people debated those calls. I did. Yeah. I thought this, whatever, but you could just pull back and make, let me just, you made a lot of good calls in 2023. Even if it was, it, you went through it. But you know, if you look back and as years go by, it'll be easier, easier and easier to look back and be like, I made the best I could with what I had on that year. If that was my worst year, you think about PA Nats that year, you we were just saying you were going to show up to compete. It got so bad. You showed up and couldn't compete. And you were like, SBD flew you out and everything. And it's like, you know what? Let me step up. How can you use me? Why don't I jump into commentating? Yep. Let me make, let me do something out of this. Let me get something out of this. Let me, let me make it right. And doors open from that. Look at a year later, same thing happens, but SPD is like, well, we could still use him for Sheffield in a, in a million different mm -hmm. ways. You give yeah. me presentations, analysis, preview show, and now interviews. Look how, what happens when you stay positive. Look what happens when 
shit hits the fan and you your reaction is like, okay, I'm getting audited right now. And this hurts. This is tough. What can I do? Just work with what you got. 2023, you worked with what you had. You know, it didn't go the way you wanted, but you're like, let me not make moves that you would do if you're younger, more immature, less experienced than we all do. Mm-hmm. And by the time you're 34 and now you're 35, but like the, that year, you could be like, all right, I make I make different moves now. Um, so there's a lot to glean from it that was positives out of negatives, if you will, right? Oh, 100%, man. The... I, I I mentioned before we were recording, like, I never want that to happen again. I, like, not that I, I, no one wants to go through those hardships, like willingly, it just kind of happens. Um, and then you just have to roll with the punches and make it the best op- like outcome you can possibly make it. But yeah, I came out of 2023, just again, I had to redefine Taylor Atwood. And that's a part of my legacy as well is like I have now hit rock bottom how am I going to climb back up am I going to get back up am I going to climb this mountain and get to the top again those are still questions that we're, are, are going to have to be answered but you better know damn well that I'm doing everything in my fucking power everything to get back to that moment and that top because that is the legacy that that is the Atwood legacy. That's a part of it. And to be able to make positive outcomes out of negative situations, that's kind of what I've had to do my entire life. So yeah, it's it's such a great point that you brought up in terms of, you know, PA Nats. I was going through it. I'm gonna be releasing a YouTube video. I mentioned that earlier off off air, but I'm going to be releasing a YouTube video that kind of takes you through what my experience was, my true experience (laughs) leading into Sheffield last year um, and how bad it really was. But not being able to compete at PA Nats and then you graciously reaching out and being like, yo, can you commentate with me? And me, even though I was going through it, it's like, hell yeah, let's do this. Like that, that, it sounds like fun. Um, just saying yes. And as you always say, just say yes. So I did. Uh, and, and who knew what was going to come out of it? And here we are. I was helping interview people at Sheffield and uh, there's different commentation things uh, entering my realm that I didn't think were possible. So yeah, it's always just, you always be prepared regardless of what uh, what's happening around you. Dude, pivot. It, it, it's the be king of the pivot. That's life is if you, the most successful people in life and the happiest people in life are those that can pivot because yeah. you'll, you probably find it out. We'll all find out life never unfolds the way you want it to, mm-hmm. but it unfolds the way it's going to go. It unfolds the way it's supposed to. And you'll have a year mapped out and none of that shit's going to happen. But when it comes down, be prepped to pivot when you need to pivot and you'd be surprised what one door closes, another door opens and God knows what happens. Maybe if you can pivot with enthusiasm, you're fine. And you, you've, you leveled up maturity wise in so many ways. Cause you got handed, you know, if you take a defeat and everybody's piling up on top of you and you, you recognize I'm not, posting or coming on a podcast or anything right now and you wait and you just you made all these calculated moves man you're gonna look back and be like 2020 everybody can act a certain way when everything's going their way how are you gonna act when things start stop going your way now you get chin checked and if that's as worse as it got you did a very good job handling a lot of shit where it's like I look appreciate at it. i wish i was at sheffield well you are at sheffield now and you're a part of the broadcast and yeah. you're like okay let me do this then. Wish I was competing at PA Nats. Well, you are, and you're commentating, and you know, all of it. It's difficult, but to in that some period in life, or you could be the one guy or girl who's like, when shit doesn't go their way, they really start self-sabotaging and hit yeah. the social media way too quickly and start doing things where it's like, oh, you're gonna regret this, or oh, it's like certain doors won't open for you because you can close doors without knowing it. It's just it's tough, man. Life is difficult. It's all about being able to, the most successful people can pivot when they need to pivot. 
you did a phenomenal, you've done a phenomenal job in, in a very difficult year. Cause otherwise that, that year could have been you. a, that year, you, you could have made that year just a fucking rap. It could have, people could look back and be like, fucking yeah, let's talk about your 2023 and rub it in your face. Instead, it's like, or 2024, like uh, now that we're in 2024, instead it's like, well, let's talk about it, man. I'm like, you know, I've been all over the world with powerlifting and doing my damn thing and a part of like Sheffield once again and other doors have opened and like, you've had some good come from it as well. Like you, that's a saving grace, man. Everyone knows people in their life that are kind of negative with things or in other people when shit comes their way, they know how to make good out of it. Mm-hmm. Even if it's not what they want. They're like, I'll, I can do something with this. Give me a minute. Mm-hmm. Give me a minute here. Let me, let me take this. Let me, let me digest it. Let me get upset for a second. Let me turn it around and let me move. Yeah. And you've done that several times from getting chin checked. And that's why you're going to be all right. And you're going to stick around and you'll be one that lasts. That's why you lasted this long, man. That's right. That's right. right? No, I appreciate that, man. Thank you. Yeah, it goes a long way. So looking at um, Sheffield's wrapped up, uh, first off, what was like mm-hmm. some of the biggest performances of Sheffield for you that stuck out? It was all on the women's side. Uh, maybe Gustav, just because he only had a 4% chance <laughs> of winning. Phenomenal, um, by the way. Talk yeah. about an underdog, underdog story. Like that, yeah. Gustav, hats off to him coming in the clutch. Um, he went eight for nine, but I think he got called on his like one bench. Uh, and it was like a technical error. So tech, like, I think he went like for sure. He went eight for nine on paper, but, uh, I think it was like his second attempt or something. And he still moved up on his third attempt on bench. So I, I consider that a nine for nine day in my book. Um, well, let me ask you so, this. This is, you know, let me ask you some straight up pointed questions, then. uh, more specific questions, not pointed, um, for the 93s. We have Gustav, who just won Sheffield and is the mm-hmm. king of kings right now with 895. Looked like room to spare. Probably did have room to spare. We have Tycho that finally missed a lift. Very rarely misses lifts. Yeah. Um, held him back on squat. He got his third squat, but it probably wasn't the planned third. You know, the old, if I miss my second, I'll take my third, take off about five kilos and do that. It was probably something along those lines that he did his third. Mm-hmm. Um, but we have Emil Krastev from Bulgaria, who in training just did 906. That's right. And that video blew up. And then the story that I shared where his friend is like, somebody's got to be the greatest. Somebody <laughs> has to be the greatest and is gassing them up. And I got chills. And and Emil got a, all of Team Bulgaria's with him flexing yeah. and a pose. And, and he was getting emotional. He did 906. Gavin is going to show up at PA Nats now. Mm-hmm. And he's like, look, at I got to go to Worlds. And you look at that turnaround from Sheffield to Worlds is way too harsh, but I'm going to do it anyways. I'm yeah. peaked. I'm ready. And if Gavin's bench hadn't dropped like seven and a half kilos, I'm not even giving him numbers he hasn't already hit. If he he squatted what he squatted at an IPF standard, he deadlifted what he deadlifted at IPF standard. If he benches what he previous benched, He'll be in the 900s as well. I'm not even giving him a bench he hasn't done before. He just needs to bench what he previously did. He's also over 900. Then you got Petrie coming over. Yeah. It's and then I mean it, it's a it's great. And Petrie, God knows what he's going to do as a 93 because he's phenomenal as a 90. Mm-hmm. It is absolutely insane what's about to happen. Going into worlds, in your opinion, not who's going to win because you don't have all the put you on the spot this far out when you don't have training footage to take a look at is yeah. like telling you it's way too far ahead. Right. But for right now, what you've seen, who do you think would be the favorite odds on favorite? Not even who you think's going to win. Cause God knows what everyone's going to do in training. But if you were to take a temperature of the room of the community odds on favorite, who do you think that would be? That's such a great question, man, because it's a murderer's row <laughs> in 93s, like the most competitive weight class, I think, in the IPF. So you have Gavin, who's a bit sporadic in terms of performance, hasn't really put together that nine for nine day and has come out on top. So it's hard for me to put my chips on the table for him just because I he hasn't proven it yet on the IPF stage. Is he capable? 100%. Um, It's just we haven't seen it yet. So 
that's the only reason I'm not going to say Gavin, but it can certainly be him. I don't know enough about Petrie yet on an IPF stage, so I'm not going to throw him in the mix, although he is a phenomenal 90 lifter. Uh, Emil, he, like, he's got Kedrick on his side in terms of uh, both training and nutrition, so mm. no stone is going unturned there. And his training looks absolutely phenomenal. However, mm. however, I'm going to go back to my original saying, I don't care what you do in training. Show me on the platform. And not saying that Emil can't put that performance on a platform, but he hasn't shown it yet. So I can't, I, I'm not going to give it to Emil, although he's, he looks very strong. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to have, I don't know what Kaiko's doing. Uh, I don't. I don't know. I don't know what he's doing. Uh, he's not doing PA Nats. I don't know if he's announced anything yet in terms of competing, um, at Worlds. So he he's a wild card for that. But uh, if he is competing, I can't not bet against him. However, like he was pushed to the limit at Sheffield and got second to Gustav. So I that that leaves only one person for me. And given that Gustav performed how he did at, at Sheffield on the biggest stage internationally in powerlifting in general, um, I think the favorite heading into Worlds is, is Gustav. Uh, that's just my personal opinion. He has almost, what, he has four months almost un under his belt for training leading into Worlds. Uh, to add to his his solidified 895 total. Um, so, like, he's the favorite, in my opinion. How about this? The 83s, Delaney Wallace, two-time world champion, but the big caveat with that was, but you didn't beat Russ to do it. Mm -hmm. And Russ casts a big shadow because he's such a, a massive star in powerlifting. Yeah, I mean, you have world champions, and then you have a star like Russ, right? Yeah. Now at Sheffield, Russ wasn't there, but Russ's world record was, and that is the highest total Russ has ever achieved at the IPF world level. Mm -hmm. And what does this mean for Delaney Wallace to have broken that world record in terms of his legacy? Well, I put up a poll, and over seventy percent said that solidifies it. They're happy enough. There's a couple of naysayers, fine. Sports, sports debate. Course, it's not going to yeah. be unanimous. Yeah. How do you feel about that? Because you've talked a little bit about, wow, oh, this guy wasn't there when I won the title. However, two-time world champion, and that guy wasn't there, but his world record was. How, how do you feel? Yeah, that's tough. That's tough. It's tough. That's tough. However, knowing that there's another bigger guy, batter guy walking around, potentially, uh, doesn't sit well with me. However, uh, that bigger and batter dude wasn't there on the day. And there were other batter dudes that did step up and at they were, they were able to Delaney was able to be that guy, not once, but twice at worlds on the international stage, the, the, the highest of the highest in terms of roughing. Um, and then, Two-time Sheffield participant, barely missed the podium last year, 2023, and then finally podiumed here in 2024 mm -hmm. while breaking the 83 total world record on his second deadlift. He kind of mm -hmm. just went for broke on his third, but he broke it on his second deadlift. And, and he was on one leg <laughs> like four weeks out i i know what he went through uh i was with him so i am just, like that's my guy he's my dude uh, i love that man to death love his parents as well i love his spirit i love everything about delaney um and, and for those that hate on delaney you don't know him as a person you see the showman but you don't know him as a person and that is the most genuine nice friendly person you'll ever probably meet in your life um he just genuinely cares about people empathetic so like i just love him from that aspect 
But as a lifter, yeah, he solidified his legacy as an 83. And uh, I was part of that 70% because ev you know how many fucking people are trying to break a world record? Especially like everyone at Sheffield is trying to break that total world record to win. Everybody. And not everyone is getting to do it. Um, Joe made a great, I would listen to your podcast uh, about the women's side. 11 of the top performances in the IPF have been at Sheffield now. That's wild. That's um, awesome. But like with uh, with Delaney, for him to break the the 83 world record at Sheffield, yeah, that solidified it for me. Um, he it, up against the pressure that he was up against knowing what he was going through leading into Sheffield with his injuries. So he wasn't even able to train at his full capacity. Just like, it just, it, it was a, it was a performance that I was not expecting. Um, but here we are broke the 83 world record. Um, and, and is the current IPF 83 standard. He's the standard. I really hope at some point we get to see Russ and Delaney go head to head. I don't know where that's going to happen, what that's going to look like. We're at yeah. a bit of a weird situation. Obviously Delaney is not going to do PA Nats like yeah. Gavin. Um, he went all out. He broke the world record. So at the very least he's made it. So Russ can't come in like he has previous years where he'd win with a 20 kilo spread. I mean, he might go over, 841 by 20 kilos, but he's not walking in there on a bad day and still being okay. Yeah. He knows the standard now is no, you, you need to PR. Yeah. You need, you need the, the best performance you've given at 83 to make it to the world team. Delaney has set a high tide for you to work with. And when he goes to worlds there, there were some great 83s around the world and a horror Jurens has done 820 and up. Like there are some fantastic 83s. Don't get me wrong. But Delaney is still the guy to beat for Russ, and Russ is the guy to beat for Delaney. Mm -hmm. It's got to happen somewhere. Yeah. If Russ wins Worlds, he's going to Sheffield. Mm -hmm. Does it happen there? I don't know. There's too much that's got to go down. But I know. It's wild. We, we, we need to see Delaney versus Russ at some time again. So I, when yeah. they faced off, and the last time they met was 2021, and nobody knew who Delaney was unless you mm -hmm. were your last name was Wallace. And he hadn't won back-to-back -back worlds. He hadn't broken. I don't even know if he cracked the 800 kilo mark. And he did 821. And everyone's like, oh, my God. Delaney showed up and just blew by. Like, he was out totaling Sean Noriega and all those guys. And then since then, and, and, you know, Sean's phenomenal. We all thought Sean was the guy that was rivaling Russ. All this time, we didn't, we just didn't realize how special Delaney was until, right. well, look at us now. He's 840 and up, two-time world champ, and, and done everything he did. It's Delaney. It, it, this new Delaney needs to face Russ, the new Russ, and we need to sort this. We got a rivalry <laughs> going now. Um, so I'm very interested. I don't know where it's going to happen. Yeah. And I, I talked to Russ about it, you know, in the DMs, and he's like, yeah, I mean, you know, it would be great, but obviously I'm going to Worlds. I'll be eyeballed, you know, his path. He wants worlds. He wants Sheffield. He wants world games. Like, I mean, he's not going to deviate if the lady lights up. Cool. But yeah, so we'll have to see it all plays out. Yeah. Uh, another one on the men's side, then I'll ask you a couple of questions about the women's, but Jesus Oliveris, um, phenomenal squatting back to back, you know, break broke Ray's world record. That's held for a long time. It's not the Ray's PR for everyone watching. Some people had asked some questions. Uh, Ray did more at an Earl Classic, but it wasn't an international event. That's so right. that's not a world record. But he did phenomenal, squatted over a thousand pounds in the same day at Sheffield. Bench twice. got away from him <laughs> twice. It's crazy. And, and that at one point, that was crazy to squat over to a thousand pounds. Sorry. And he, for him to do it twice is insane in the same event. Bench got a little away from him. Yeah. So he dug himself a hole and went all in on that last deadlift. And it was a hell of a show loading it up, but it wasn't there on the day. He was chasing Dan Bell's wrapped total. Mm -hmm. Do you think he takes Dan Bell's wrapped total in 2024? Given if like he's a shoe in to 
to win worlds. Doesn't really make sense to break the world record there. I don't know if he's going to com compete in the second half of 2024. So you saying no doesn't mean you don't believe he can. It just might be timeline wise. But what do you think? Are we waiting for Sheffield on this? And does that just set the table for him to possibly win Sheffield again? You know, it, it because he'll be even stronger. He's in his mid twenties. Yeah. W what are your thoughts on it? So, do I think that he can do it? Yes, I, I, without a shadow of a doubt. It's just a matter of when, and it's. I, I don't think it would even make sense to do it this year, because, like. You're a shoe in to win at Worlds. No one's going to come close to you. And given at his body weight, to shift that much weight within a calendar year, like he's hitting levels that just are unfathomable, have never been touched and or reached. So like we don't know <laughs> physiologically what is actually happening with his joints, with his body, um, shifting all that weight year in and year out. So if he doesn't have to personally i don't i wouldn't and i would just load up at sheffield um mm. in 2025 win worlds get your your bid and then start training and and getting your redemption because that's i mentioned it earlier on the podcast one of the things i wanted to talk about was the sheffield performances and the men's underwhelming that was an underwhelming performance from him and that respectfully hey Zeus, don't sound bite this either this is just me respectfully oh, sound bite. <laughs> so res this is me out of context i'm just gonna put that in that's all that's the, uh, that is actually what this episode is gonna be called <laughs> oh my god so i listened to your your podcast and and matt gary was like look you got to take the good with the bad as well um, and we got to call a spade a spade. And I think that's, that's where we're at with it. Like, don't take it any other way. Use it as motivation. So, but I'm going to call a spade a spade. That was a very underwhelming performance. And he made some rookie mistakes, which I was not expecting. Um, his bench press, he had some technical errors. He stepped back on his first deadlift. Like there were just uncommon errors on his end. I did, I don't know what was going on. Uh, either physically or mentally, but it wasn't the Jesus that we saw in 2023. Um, and and I think there were some things outside in life. His mom got sick last year, so he was he had a different spirit and mindset about him, and he needs to figure out how to get back to that that spot. And then I think he can do that rap that damn bell wrapped total. I think he can perform that, but it's going to take another. 2023 mentality to get back to that level um but do we see it here in 2024 personally i don't think i don't think so and i don't think it's necessary uh and again just given that he's pushing that much weight it just like you don't know what you're doing you only get so many <laughs> uh mm. of those performances within your career and it's like don't waste it um at a world championship when you're already a shoe in to win face yourself good advice from the goat let's move to the women i have a couple questions here for you so yes. turbo tiff did phenomenal evie corrigan again uh establishing herself as the woman to beat in the 52s and she's likely going to stay a 52 yeah. um so probably going to be a heavy favorite there and we'll see how long she stays 52 but in the 57s i want to ask you your opinion on this one very interesting starting to see a bit of a pattern here mm -hmm. jajaka coming in second at Worlds and turning into the world champion Slayer at Sheffield. Yep. Joy Namani, who two-time world champion is a 52, two-time world champion is a 57, multiple-time world record breaker, and loses to Jad at Sheffield. And then at Worlds, the best lifter of Worlds 2023, Natalie Richards, star in the making, still a star in the making, still a mm -hmm. fast-rising star, coming to Sheffield the favorite for sure based off of that performance. And Jad Jacob once again gets revenge. In a road to Sheffield, she said straight up, use the word revenge. Yeah. Some people don't like talking like that. Yeah. Some people like, no, well, I'm just going to focus on me. And she's like, no, I want revenge. Yeah. Which means like, a revenge on you. Mm -hmm. And threw it out there. 
which I love a little spice and the French can get spicy, believe oh, me. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. comes in and, and, and pulls through and hits that and, and ends up again. She's become the world champion slayer when it comes to Sheffield. Who, who is the favorite again? You don't know the training. So I won't ask you your pick mm -hmm. just favorite as of now, from what you saw from Sheffield and at worlds going into the world championships in the 57s. Yeah, it, look, again, I think that uh, I, I mentioned this in the preview show. Jad hasn't won a world championship in the Open yet. And sure. she she had something to prove. Natalie came in kind of the underdog, and she had that at Worlds. Uh, she had that tenacity about her. She was like, I'm here to prove myself. It's my first world championship. Um, but she came, she, she was the dark horse. So she kind of had that uh, competitive advantage over Jad. Jad was kind of the favorite going in, I think, uh, in my opinion. So I think Jad maybe was like not stepping on the gas like as much as possible. And and Natalie came in and, and just had that, that edge, that slight edge. And it showed at Worlds and she won. But at Sheffield, <laughs> at Sheffield, we saw Jad come in with that, that vengeance, that uh, that mentality of I'm going to take what's mine. I deserve this, and I know I deserve this. And we saw it, man. Like she was on a tear. Like when I saw her walking out on squad, I was like, damn, that's a woman on a fucking mission. <laughs> and I, I saw her come out for her dead, and I was like, she. I, I don't think Natalie is going to do it. And nothing against Natalie. Again, respectfully. Um, I just think that Jod had that that competitive advantage in terms of mindset because she just lost. So she had this kind of how I feel. I lost worlds and I, I have never felt more motivated to get back into the weight room and get stronger again. So I know how it feels from Jod's perspective to lose and especially to lose how she lost. She on her third deadlift, it just like it just put salt in the wound for her, I think. And she was probably thinking about that consistently every day leading into Sheffield. And uh, we saw what, what came out and, and she came out on top and, and slayed the world reigning champion in Natalie. So I think that um, it's going to take that mentality again from Jad, keep that same mindset. And I think that she can win the world championship in June. Um, but Natalie certainly has to can like now she p potentially has that advantage um, and her, her coaching staff and, and whatever it may be, they have to switch some things up. So who knows, but again, given that Jad did it on the biggest stage, um, she didn't buckle under pressure. I'm going to have to give it to Jad right now. And that hurts because I love Natalie. Like, and you're an American. <laughs> I know it, it's a, it, um, and you're like team, you, you back your team, but it's a great rivalry. If nothing else, this is what the sport needs this is what the 57s need is you want that you want it. Yeah. Hit for tap back and forth. You win one. I win one. And it's yeah. so close. The pundits are like, I don't know. I don't know. And then again, after you watched your training, maybe you flip flop back and forth like two, three more times. Yeah. Like, oh my God, I was thinking that until I saw that deadline. Like, who knows what's going to happen leading into Worlds, but it's interesting. Let's move into the talking about the 63s, 69s. I say that clumped together because we had some 63s and 69s. We even had a 76 in the mix at Sheffield. Yeah. But for you, I I'll just throw this out there. Look, Leah Babwa and Gara, both 582.5 for Gara, 585 for Leah. Those are numbers that in 2022, was 76 kilo world championship winning totals. And now these ladies are doing it as small 69s. Neither yeah. one of them cut. Both of yeah. them were under the weight class. Yep. And then of course I got the shitco being the first 69 to total 600 kilos. Absolutely ridiculous for you. What was the most surprising performance first? And second, you know, Agatha said straight off the bat, I want to go 76 because I have unfinished business yeah. with Carlina. What would you say to each of these lifters? What weight class would you suggest if you were the consultant they each go in? So first question, 
the most surprising, not impressive, that's obviously Agatha, but the most surprising performance followed by which weight class would you suggest? For each of the ladies? Yeah, each of okay. them. Gara, because you got a reigning world yeah. champion, reigning 69 and silver medalist in 76. So I think uh, most, I, I'm going to have to go with the, the Sheffield champion and, and Agatha Shitko as the most like impressive performance. Just who the hell knew 9% <laughs> was going to win Sheffield 2024? Like what? 51 kilos over the world total uh, record. And like, I, just, you can talk a good game and, and she backed that shit up completely. Like she, she talked it. She said she was going to do it. She came in and she did it. Um, I didn't think she it was going to happen. She even called her shot. She called it. She called that shit. I was, I was blown away. I was on the preview show. I was thinking four or 5%. So even, um, this is this is another thing. Like I think that the Sheffield is a great sp spectacle of of performances, but what we're going to start seeing are great performances being outdone by other great performances, and we're not going to be able to revel in uh, appreciating what just happened because Leah, for example, like she beat the world record by seven and a half percent like mm -hmm. that is that's mind-blowing as well and, and like carla it just it, i just wish that she's the str second strongest i love leah leah is my girl she she's a part of team tsg um so i it, like i thought she was gonna win i knew she, she was gonna be around that five percent and that's what i thought it was gonna take to to win Sheffield. So I had Leah winning. Um so when when Agatha came in and hit nine percent and even Leah beating what I was anticipating in five percent, she beat two percent more. I was like Phew. but that that performance got uh from Leah got outshined by Agatha and that's that unfortunate and fortunate with Sheffield like we're gonna we're going to see that happen. Like great performances get, get outperformed by other great performances. So Agatha hands down the best performance, in my opinion, uh, the women's side just in general was the most exciting for me. Um, seeing, <laughs> seeing a 300 and a half kilo squat from Sunita. Hey, don't get ahead too much. I'm, I'm, I'm I know, with, with but like, holy shit. I, you're getting excited. You're like, all right, all right. Yeah. My bad, my bad. So, <laughs> the so weight, weight class, so do you weight, think they yeah. should, yeah. So, with Agatha, I'll start with her. Personally, like, I, I have personally said to myself, I want to be the king of 74. That's what I want my brand to be. That's what I want Taylor Atwood's legacy like you just know me as the set, the one weight class guy. Um, I think the the times are are changing, and in hindsight, I think I would go back personally and and probably do eighty three at least one year to just say, look, I know I can beat the eighty threes if I just eat a fucking cheeseburger and go weigh in. <laughs> um, so I wish I would have done that. So if, with Agatha. She has unfinished business in 76s. So she just showed what she could do at 69. She destroyed the world record total. So go eat up, have fun, go train some more and be dominant in the 76s as well. So that's that's what I think of Agatha. Um with Leah. Leah, she cut to 63. She in 2022, she didn't make weight. Um, got her revenge in 2023, but again, in a different weight class. So for me, I think that she should stay where she's comfortable in terms of like eating, not having to stress about making weight because um, it's just, it's, it's another stressor that you just don't need to worry about. So personally, if I was her, I would eat into the 69. She weighed in at what, 66 or 67? So she's got plenty of, of, of room to grow within that weight class and just continue to get 
strong as fuck. <laughs> so that's my advice to her. Um, and then Corolla, like, I would love to see Leah and her battle it out again, two and a half kilos, uh, separ separating them. And that's just, again, it's a rivalry. And I, so personally, I would love to see that battle again at Worlds for them two to push each other. So I'm going to stick with her in the 69s as well. And if I may, so obviously Agatha's already said she's going 76. Yeah. Leah told me she's going to stay 69. And Corolla Garo told me she's going to stay 69. Nice. So exactly what you wanted is exactly what you're going to get. Go. To. And, Let's go. Let's uh, go. You're right. So for me, I would just say I wouldn't be half mad if Agatha collected the 69 kilo world title, then went to next Sheffield as a 76 and battled uh, Carlina head to head. And then she would be, um, she'd be a 69 kilo world champion. Then she could go Sheffield to 76 and potentially grab a 76 kilo world title, two time world, two division world champion. And then let's take a look. If she goes 84, she's in her early twenties. That's she's wild. in her early twenties and she's That's moonlighted. An, uh... She's moonlighted as an 84. She could be a three division world champion. Cause she's on early twenties. By the time she's early thirties, she might collect an 84 kilo world title at some points conceivable three-time world champion in three different weight classes. My God, that's what I would tell her, but she is her own woman. She's going to do what she's going to do. I, I, we stayed up till the wee hours of the morning and um, I tried to, I tried to, you know, convince, but it is, she wants Carlina. <laughs> she, she wants Carlina and Carlina. And it's a nice segue is like, come and get it, love. Yeah. Come and get it. I, uh, I'm open for business. So, and I'm very, I'm happy Carlina who never has an easy time for travel, multiple time zone changes, flying all the way across the world yeah. for this, um, doing 610, Agatha doing 600, a weight class below. It begs the question, what happens? What happens? What happens mm -hmm. if they're both 76s? And Agatha now has got all the momentum on her side. Who Agatha do you had think more, would be, she had more in the tank too. Who, who, yeah. Who do you think would be the favorite as of now? Again, it's not a prediction mm -hmm. uh, because you haven't seen any other training temperature in the room so this isn't even your opinion it's more like your opinion who should be the favorite it's your opinion who you think the confidence is behind to win this showdown by the community who do you think would be the favorite like that for 76 yeah agatha versus carlina i i have to i have to have my recency bias with agatha like her now gaining weight she had kilos in the tank <laughs> which is insane um yeah and she opened with the bench world record, even cutting. She cut down and still opened with the bench record. I was that was mind blowing, and that's the first thing that typically goes when you cut weight. So yeah. for her to continue her her strength on bench while cutting weight, I expect her bench to just continue to increase, as well as the other lifts. So yeah, like, and she's young. She. <laughs> to be 20 21 years old and doing what she's doing um that that's insane so i i think just my recency bias with what i've seen nothing against carlina i think she's a great talent as well i just think that uh agatha has the the edge there i mean in terms of the confidence behind agatha right now it's got to be sky high her yeah. stock is the highest in all of powerlifting probably. And oh, that's, 100%. yeah, of course, nothing against Carlina, but that's, a, that's just, that's not a Carlina thing. That's not a lack of confidence with Carlina. It speaks to the huge amount of confidence yeah. in Agatha right now. You right. could probably put pretty much anybody's name and they're going to be like, Agatha. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's just, the people have a lot of confidence in her right now. And for good reason. Um, Amanda did phenomenal as she always does. She's to go at 84 mm -hmm. begging begging for a rival to step <laughs> forward um and see it. she might just she might just have to wait a, a, a stitch a couple years. carlina Car carlina's like old school you where you were like i'm staying she's staying 76 she said when i had her on the podcast she's like i don't think i'm ever leaving but i get to might but i get to might so let i get to do her business at 76 and yeah. who the heck knows she, sky's the limit she's 600 out of 69 as an 84 i don't know she even joked around about becoming an 84 plus just to, <laughs> just for shits and giggles to see what she would do. She'd be super small, but who knows? That subtotal will be monstrous. 
Um, and then obviously the 84 plus is speaking of phenomenal showing by them. Another, a good battle. Sonita being the first woman tested or untested in sleeves to cross that 300 kilo barrier. Yeah. So she did a Jesus Oliveras, which yep. is insane, man. Yeah. A woman squatting 300 kilos tested in knee sleeves. It's it's crazy. Well, also Brittany. Brittany hit, uh, I think, 280. Yeah, yeah Br- Brittany's squat. But overall, Brittany crossing over the 700 kilos. 700, it, right. Yeah, 700 kilo mark, 710. So when Alexis Jones comes over from USAPL and they clash at Worlds, I'm glad Brittany had that 710 in there because um, Alexis Jones has done 721. Okay, we're close enough for a battle now. That's right. Previously, if you're still in the 600s, people are like, well, it's Alexis Jones all day. If someone wanted to say Alexis Jones is still the favorite, I'm okay with that, obviously. Alexis Jones is phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Strong. Like, I mean, the strong, tested, untested, whatever you want. She's got the biggest total. She's right. the Jesus Oliveras on the on the women's side. But Brit is a bona fide battle tested now at the world's level twice. Yeah, Brit, it cannot be taken lightly. She's really blossoming and finding her groove right now. And I'm glad because Alexis needs a rival. You don't want it to be like when Bonica was on top and had nobody. People stop watching. Right. Like, guess what? Sports, by the fourth quarter of the Bulls, if they're just kicking the shit out of somebody, people are going to try to beat traffic and get on the way home. Yeah. You want it close. Yeah. I, some people like get upset when they're like, why are you trying to make a rival? This person's not even close to me. It's like, you want me to. Trust me. <laughs> you, do you want people to care? Then you want right. me to hype this and pretend it's close at least. And, and I'm not pretending now, but there are other times where I'm trying to find on commentary, trying to yeah. find a way where, well, it's not over yet. The last thing you want me to do as a commentator is say, it's all over, folks. No need to come <laughs> see <Right>. deadlifts. <laughs> and people are like, you're saying it's close when it's not. I'm doing my job. But anyways, <laughs> um, these people are actually becoming rivals. It is actually legitimate now. Mm-hmm. Thank God. Brit is leveled up just in time. And um, I think she can level up yet again and force Alexis to, she's going to have to hit all of her best lifts yeah. after flying across the world. And travel, the bigger you get, the travel's harder. Ask Ray Williams. You know, they'll tell you. Ask Matt Gary. Like it, when people say, oh, travel doesn't mean anything. Look, it's not the actual flying time. It is all of the variables when you're in a different country and you're in a different part of the world where sleep is now in a variable, finding your water, finding your food, how are you sleeping over, overseas and getting adjusted to different time zones. Like that all has an effect on the body. It's not just the flying time. Like when <laughs> most of the people that are saying that, travel shouldn't have an impact haven't actually fucking done it <laughs> yeah no I, like I know. they haven't well, even well, done it because they're trying to compare totals of their own to people who've doing it, right. done it abroad and they don't want to have to put that factor and in terms of the travel when you're when you're taking flights when you are a super heavyweight man or woman it'll impact you even differently like yes. like matt gary talks about how it impacted ray and like when you're when you're a bigger human that kind of going up thirty thousand feet in a, in a cramped up plane and doing all that it uh, it it will for sure and you're seated overnight for hours and you're expected to sleep while sitting up and, and you're a larger human being is more difficult sure. and um it, it, these are just variables it is what it is and i think alexis probably is going to be still the favorite given she's the strongest woman we've ever seen in powerlifting tested or untested yeah but brit will be ready because she's been battle tested under those adverse circumstances oh, yeah. And she's also in the 710s now, and or 700s. And 710 to 721, when you're super heavyweight, what is that? One squat difference? You miss a squat and Brit's on your ass. So you need it like that. International I need too. to. I'm okay with Alexis being the favorite, but I need it that Brit's close enough. You miss a fucking deadlift and Brit's got you. You miss yep. a squat and Brit's got you. And guess what? Brit has done that before. That's right. This is good for women's 84 plus. Yes. Otherwise, we're back to the Benica Brown days where it's just Benica all day by a, a country mile. That's and right. Nothing to see here, folks. You know, it is what it is. But um, but yeah, there we go, man. We wrapped up the Sheffield real, real, real quick, quick and tidy. Yeah. yeah, man. Well, I mean, sometimes you got to be quick and dirty with it and just, <laughs> and just belt it off because we had done 
like a Sheffield recap, a couple different yeah, episodes, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I didn't want to spend too much to regurgitate what we already said, but there was some specific questions I wanted to ask you to get your opinion. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and yeah, there it is. Listen, man, we're getting close to three hours now. Um, I, first of all, if I appreciate you easy. past six Too now. easy. Yeah, uh, dog, dog, it is what it is, man. It is what it is. But I appreciate you, King. Um, thank you for coming on. Obviously, it's it's open door policy. Whenever the hell you don't, I don't got to invite you, right? Like you could just be like, "Hey, dog, <laughs> let's let's talk. Let's get on and talk." It, it doesn't have to be an event that you're doing, but an event that we're going to talk about, like we just did with yeah, Sheffield or whatever. Sure. Um, yeah. And obviously, yeah. So keep in touch and freaking uh, let me know what's going on with uh, all your different events that you got throughout the year when you pick an event. Let me know what event it's going to be. And let's freaking let's belt off some more podcasts leading into worlds after worlds. Let me get your thoughts on things. And hopefully I see you at some of these events too. Yes, sir. And, and, uh, and yeah, maybe we'll be doing more media work together. Let's see. Yes, sir. Let's get it. All right, man. Um, until next time, everybody, please do subscribe. Give us high ratings. And as per usual, six pack lap of that six up and we are up.